Sharon, you ready? So it's 6.32. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. At this time, we're going to have our Pledge of Allegiance. Not seeing the flag yet. Oh, I see the one in chief's office. So let's do that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, chief. <laughs> um, at this time, please note that all counselors are here except Counselor Merritt. Um, we're gonna uh, go into our proclamation. I do know that we have some attendees. Um, I believe our channel eight is one of our attendees and I think um, our, one of our proclamations is of uh, interest to them. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with our proclamation declaring racism a public health crisis. I think everyone have the proclamations in their uh, possession. Um, I'll read a proclamation, then I'll read a statement, um, and then I'll open it up if anyone has anything to say. Whereas racism is a social system with multiple dimensions, individual racism that is interpersonal and or in internalized or systematic race, systemic racism that is institutional or structural and is a system of structuring opportunity and assessing value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. And whereas race is a social construct with no biological basis and whereas racism unfairly disadvantages specific individuals and communities while unfairly giving advantages to other individuals and communities and scrapes the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources, I'm sorry, and saps the, synth, the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And whereas racism is a root cause of poverty and constricts economic mobility and whereas racism causes persistent de discrimination and desperate outcomes in many areas of life, including housing, education, employment, and criminal justice, and is itself a social determinant of health. And whereas racism and segregation have exacerbated a health divide resulting in people of color in Connecticut bearing a disproportionate burden of illness and mortality, including COVID-19 infection and death, heart disease, diabetes, infant mortality, and whereas Black, Native American, Asian, and Latino residents are more likely to experience poor health outcomes as a consequence of inequities in economic stability, education, physical environment, food, and access to health care. And these inequities are themselves a result of racism. And whereas more than 100 studies have linked racism to worse health outcomes, and whereas the collective prosperity and well being of Bloomfield depend upon equitable access to opportunity for every resident, regardless of color of the color of their skin. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Bloomfield, one, assess that, assert that racism is a public health crisis affecting Bloomfield and all of Connecticut. Work to progress as an, work to progress as an equity and justice oriented organization by continuing to identify specific activities to enhance diversity and to ensure anti-racism racism principles across our leadership, staffing and contracting. Promote equity through all policies approved by the town of Bloomfield and enhance educational efforts aimed at understanding, addressing and dismantling racism and how it affects the delivery of human and social services economic development and public safety, improve the quality of the data Bloomfield collects 
and the analysis of that data. It is not enough to assume that an initiative is pr producing its intended outcomes. Qualitative and quantitative data should be used to as assess inequities in impact and continuously improve. Continue to advocate locally for relevant policies that improve health in communities of color and support local, state, regional, and federal initiatives that advance his efforts to dismantle systemic racism. Further work to solidify alliances and partnerships with other organizations that are confronting racism and encourage other local, state, regional, and national entities to recognize racism as a public health crisis. Support community efforts to amplify issues of racism and engage actively and authentically with communities of color wherever they live and identify clear goals and objectives, including periodic reports to the town council to assess progress and capitalize on opportunities to further advance racial equity. Dated Bloomfield, Connecticut, this 22nd day of June, 2018, Suzette DeVitham Brown Mayor, David Mann, Deputy Mayor, Councilors Calhoun, DiLorenzo, Goff, Curtin, Merritt, Politis, and Wong. I also just want to read a statement. Black Health Matters. There is a health and food security code read issued experienced by black and brown families in the town of Bloomfield and in urban centers across the state. COVID-19 clearly resurrected the virus of health inequities with the disproportionate contra contractions of and deaths due to COVID-19. When it comes to research, testing, training, and prevailing illnesses that we have due to comorbidity problems compounded by the lack of adequate resources for adequate health care, and the time has come for us to address systemic racism in health care delivery services, we must reconstruct financial health resources and ensure that they are being applied equitably. With the death of hashtag George Floyd and others before him, the severe socioeconomic divide and the emotional and mental trauma that compounds the matters for slavery, from slavery to the present, we need to begin to look at the complexities of these issues from a 360 degree perspective by inserting what we need for our community. With that being said, please note, there's also an email from the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District. As a director of health, as a director of the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District, I fully support the council in their declaration of proclamation on racism is a public health crisis. We will continue to work with the town of Bloomfield, community partners and stakeholders in addressing health disparities and inequities. This came from uh, Amy Krause, the director of health. Uh, do we have any comments on this proclamation? Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Curtin, please go ahead and unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I just want to uh, note for the record that Bloomfield is the second town uh, that has passed uh, this resolution today. I think uh, Windsor was the first town. I just wanna say that. So uh, I do support this and, uh, and I believe uh, everyone in the town uh, do agree with this resolution. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think it's extremely important for us in a town uh, as special as ours uh, to be behind this kind of a proclamation and to see it through over time, putting putting bones, putting flesh on these bones to make the pro to make this town truly what it can be and should be, and to respond to the needs of uh, black families uh, everywhere. I think the time is right. I think we've reached a point of no turning back, and I I fully support this. Thank you. Council Calhoun, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, uh, council members and all that are in the audience this afternoon, this evening. Um, I am in full support of this proclamation. I myself believe this is fully overdue. 
although uh, COVID-19 has not uh, been around as we know it, the systematic uh, systems that have been put into place and have been continually ongoing for well over 50 years um, plus have put us in the situation, people of color in the situation uh, of where we are now with unequal health care, um, just ineptabilities um, in dealing with daily functions. So uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I am in full support of this proclamation. Thank you very much. I see some head nodding for those who may not be able to see. Um, thank you very much, Council. This is extremely important. I do know that one of the uh, first initiatives that the Health District will take on is a community needs assessment to see exactly what our community is. Uh, is it hypertension? Is it heart disease? Is it diabetes? And then figure out from there, based on the data, how we need to address and help our residents um, during this particular health crisis. So thank you very much. We're going to move on um, to a resolution calling on the state to expand voting options. Now, once again, I believe that everyone has the resolutions. Um, this resolution is coming out of the fact of COVID-19 once again, and that there's people that still feel uneasy being out in public. So we wanna make sure that everyone has the opportunity to vote. Um, so I will, jump down um, mid page. Whereas the right to vote is fundamental to a free and democratic society and increased participation in elections enhance our democracy. And whereas there are many reasons other than illness or physical absence that may make it difficult for an elector to vote in person, including work schedule and childcare needs, and whereas absentee voting offers a proven method of secure voting, and whereas government should do everything in its power to maximize participation in elections and improve voter access, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the existing need for Connecticut to join the large majority of, the, of states in which any qualified voter may vote absentee without offering a reason, and whereas municipalities will incur significant increased costs associated with holding elections during the pandemic and will therefore require additional funds to procure personal protective equipment, purchase additional equipment and materials for processing a ma massive increase in the number of absentee ballots and recruit and train new poll workers in election staff. And now therefore be it resolved by the town council of the town of Bloomfield. The town council calls on the general assembly to convene in special session for the purpose of amending the general statutes to adopt the changes to absentee voting procedures made by governor Led Ned Lamont Executive Order 7QQ for all future elections and appropriating significant funds to municipalities to defray the significant increased costs of holding elections during the pandemic. Section two, the town council calls on the General Assembly to convene in special session for the purpose of adopting a joint resolution to amend the state of Connecticut to permanently allow any elector to vote by absentee ballot for any reason and to submit such joint resolution to the proper vote for ratification in the November election dated at Bloomfield, Connecticut, this 22nd day of June, Suzette DeBeath and Brown Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor David Mann, Councilor Calhoun, DiLorenzo, Goff, Curtin, Merritt, Politis, and Wong. And the next proclamation will be um, on National Caribbean American Heritage Month. And I'm going to also jump down. Whereas our nation is safer, stronger, and healthier because of their service and sacrifice, the President of the United States and his administration are dedicated to maintaining and strengthening the partnerships within the Caribbean regions.
which were forged through bonds of friendship, diplomacy, and a shared commitment to democratic principles. And whereas these are principles of strategic engagement in the areas of human and equal rights. Maritime security, crime prevention, and I'm so sorry, education, health emergency, economic growth, and disaster recovery and relief. Strong stability in the Caribbean will increase trade, job creation, investment, and efforts to count to counter organ counter organized crime, thus ensuring a more secure and prosperous United States. Now, therefore, I, Suzette DeBeetham Brown, Mayor of the Town of Bloomfield, on behalf of the Bloomfield Town Council, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2020 as National Caribbean Heritage Month and extend blessings to all. Dated at Bloomfield, 22nd day of June 2020, Suzette DeBeetham Brown, Mayor, uh, uh, David Mann, Deputy Mayor, Councilors Calhoun, DiLorenzo, Golf, Curtin, Merritt, Politis, and Wong. Those are all the uh, proclamations that we have right now. Um, we're not gonna have the report from um, our town clerk. But with that said, um, I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor, do you have your hand up, sir? Hold on. Yes, I do, Madam Mayor. I'm just wondering, uh, one of these items is, is listed as a resolution. Does that require a vote? I think it would. Uh, Was that the? The one on the, ex to the state on vo expanding voter options. Okay, we can take a vote on it. Attorney on the, the, the attorney on the line? Mark, Mark, I know he's here. Mark, Mark, he, he's unmuted. I know. Yeah. Mark, I could be wrong, um, but I don't think so. Um, Councillor Goff, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. No, I, I was going to make the same point that uh, the Deputy Mayor made. I think we're all in support of this, but I thought resolutions of the council needed to be uh, moved and acted on by the council, but I, I'm certainly willing to take a ruling from the parliamentarian. I would also like to make a comment ultimately on this resolution, but the, the, you know, we can wait until we have a ruling. So Mark, your hand is up, but you're unmuted. We've been calling for you. So um, you're, we know that you're talking, but we can't hear you. So I think he's having some difficulty with his screen. Do you think you can type the response? Okay, since we're having um, difficulty, let's just um, make sure that we're, uh, we're correct in this. So we have the resolution um, on the table. Is it possible to get a, um, a motion on the floor? Still move. There's a motion, is there a second? Second. We got a, okay, a discussion? Uh -huh. uh, Councilor Goff, go ahead. Yes, I, 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 I totally support this uh, resolution and I think, I think everyone on the council, I hope does. Um, the one thing, though, I would like to say about it is the last uh, sec section two section, which calls for the legislature to amend the Constitution to make the, um, you know, to make absentee voting the norm. I fully support that being one option. I would like 
and I don't think we need to change this, but I would encourage uh, I would encourage folks to also write the legislature to look at some of the other things that have been talked about for years, since it's, such as early voting, which happens in a lot of states, uh, normal mail-in ballots without any kind of absentee, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, attestation. Uh, there's always, you know, since I was a kid, they've been talking about making election day a holiday instead of having it in the middle of the week. So I, I'm completely in favor of this. I think the, the uh, the resolution, the purpose of the resolution speaks, speaks for itself to make it easier to vote and to make sure that more, more people can vote. Uh, but I, I just want to make sure that I would be on record as uh, there are a variety of things that can do that and I think they should all apply. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So this resolution was sent to us. So we're just- No, that's fine. I, with, yeah. With what they sent. Um, Councillor Merritt. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Am I unmuted? Yes, Can you, you are. Thank you. Uh, I think all of these resolutions, or whatever they are, implies that we all support it. And I, I think we all do. And I think it would be best in all of these cases if we voted uh, just so, I mean, there'd be no misunderstanding about it that, uh, um, that it had the complete support of the town council. Okay. so. Councilor Merritt wants to make sure that everyone knows that the whole council supports all the uh, proclamation resolutions. So Councilor Curtin, do you want to just amend your motion to include all the proclamation? Um, yeah, you got to unmute. Absolutely, absolutely Madam Mayor. Um, I accept the friendly amendment to accept all the resolutions. Because just for clarification, uh, when it comes to the vote in uh, the town of Bloomfield, this is a state statute. We can't invoke, uh, you know, or change anything. So this is just a message that we're sending to the legislator that we do support this. Yeah. Yep. So who second the who second your first motion? Was it Patrick? I think it was uh, okay. Patrick. I think. So, who, yeah. so whoever did, everyone agrees. Of Councillor yeah. Goff, maybe was you? Did it's you? Patrick. You, Patrick. Okay. Council. So we all agree. Um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, so everyone agrees that we do all of that. Um, one of the things that I had um, asked for the town clerk um, that we couldn't get together today, um, I want a presentation on um, council committees in, in, in diversity. There was a uh, event here on Friday and um, Ed Garcia made a statement that there are no um, minorities or no uh, uh, Hispanics on um, boards or commissions, but I think he was being very specific about one board. But I wanted to make sure that um, everyone knew that our racial makeup of our town is 35.7% white, 57.5% African American, 0.3% Native American, 1.9% Asian, 0.1% Pacific Islander, 1.70% from other races, and 3% from two or more races, Hispanic or Latino um, of any race were 5.6% of the population. That was as of the 2020 census, the 2010 census. With that being said, I think uh, Mr. Garcia also made a statement and Councillor Goff, I think, disagreed with um, the committees that the council appoints go through committee on committees. Then there's a recommendation to the council and all nine members of the council vote on those members for those committees. However, during this Juneteenth event, Mr. Garcia took it uh, upon himself to make a personal declaration that Hispanics were not considered. His uh, dissatisfaction was that he was not appointed to the, lib uh, the library building committee. We have a policy on council where there is a form that everyone who's interested on serving on any boards or commission fills out for the last three years. And it's public knowledge. We can find out who applies. We can find out who gets appointed. Once again, public knowledge. And it was very uh, disconcerting that we had 
that display and that some uh, of, of our leadership um, endorsed that. So I wanted to get uh, some information from Marguerite. Uh, the information that I do have is public knowledge, but she was not able to um, make the presentation and it is a part of the special um, council agenda. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's thinking that it's not, please read your agenda carefully. Um, I do realize that racism comes in all forms you can find them from black people, from white people, from Hispanics, from Asians. You can find them town council, town buildings, um, DTCs, everywhere else. We're just gonna call it out every time we see it and or feel it and the bad behavior cannot and will not continue. With that being said, we will go to count up. Councilor Curtin. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, I'm happy that you did address um, that incident that occurred, I think it was this um, Juneteenth, this past Friday. And I think you were spot on in regards to, at least since we have um, came into office back in 2017, we've made every effort to reach out to the community as a whole to get volunteers. So I thought that uh, the attack on you uh, was unwarranted at that, um, at that gathering. And in addition to that, I know the cameras were there. So we live in an environment where we have someone at the higher, highest office who just say things. So I guess it's a pattern that everyone gets into these days where I guess if you, if you say it as much, people start believing it. So I'm happy that you addressed it tonight. Uh, this council has made every effort uh, in outreach into the community and I thought that was uh, irresponsible for a member of our D DTC who is a state central to, to come out and make outrageous comments like that with no merit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have two, I do, I just wanna make sure I don't see any other hands. Councilor Calhoun, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. As the chairperson for Committee on Committees, we have a thorough review and as of recommendations from the DTC, you, myself, and Councilor Politis are a part of Committee on Committees. When it's necessary for us to meet to decide who will go forward in consideration with the DTC, um, we take into those considerations to bring those, um, those recommendations forward to the full council to vote on. So as thus far, I do believe that Ed Garcia is the only Hispanic that currently resides on the DTC. There are, aren't any others that are participating and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, um, but it's unfortunate. And I, for one, as committee on committee chair, mm -hmm. I impose myself and I continually suggest and put it out there to the full town, especially prior to um, COVID, that we would love and fully support for the town to come and participate on some of these commissions and committees. Um, so it was very disruptive for him to do, is very unbecoming of the position that he holds um, as far as representing the DTC. That type of behavior does not represent me, and I'm quite sure it doesn't represent many of us on this council, and hopefully on the DTC that it doesn't represent. So I abhor, abhor that type of behavior. I would again imply, and I would definitely, I was I'm sorry, losing my, my, uh, techno, my technology here. Um, I would love to see for all of those that represent all races and, and backgrounds to participate on and with when we have openings for committees and councils. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. We do have um, two um, in the Q&A. Uh, Lynette Eastman, I was a little disappointed to find out that the Lieutenant 
that the governor and the lieutenant governor facilitated a roundtable discussion on racial uh, equi equity and social justice in our town on Juneteenth, and there was no Board of Education representation. In addition, because this took place in Bloomfield, I feel that the public should have been made aware that this discussion was taking place. I understand everyone could not be invited due to social distancing. However, many could have uh, tuned in to support our town had we known about it. Um, Lynette, thank you very much for your question slash comment. The um, round table was by invitation and that invitation came out from the Lieutenant Governor's office. And you are correct, social distancing was the paramount um, reason why it was a clo semi-closed meeting. I did take the liberty of sending uh, the town council an invite and gave them information as to what was taking place. Um, Ms. Graham Days, there's two of them and I'll read the first one. Ed Garcia was out of order and Councillor Goff and his handler and majority support wasn't, why wasn't Councillor Goff calling his friend out publicly as Ed Garcia attempted to humiliate Mayor DeBeath and Brown? Any comments, Councillor Goff? Uh, Ed Garcia is, attempted to rally the Hispanic community members to become politically involved. Why didn't he bring reference Hispanic people within the community to our DTC caucus in January? Could it be that he wants to be the only Hispanic person involved? Coming from someone who fought the DTC executive committee at the time for him to become a member of the DTC. Lynette, I saw Leon Rivers there why was he invited? Lynette, I have absolutely no, I, I have no answer for that. I, once again, I can only say the only people that I took the liberty to invite was the town council. Mark Saunders, when it is appropriate, please ask a date and time when the next committee and committee meeting will be held. Um, Stephanie, are you still on? Steph. Um, yes. And Mark, I have received your email. I haven't responded to you because we're still working out that date. Um, we had set the uh, date for tomorrow or Wednesday, but that's been postponed again. And it may not be until the beginning of after the 4th of July holiday. So that date has not been set. Marguerite, the town clerk, and I in uh, India the um, the clerk to the council are currently still working on uh, that date. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Goff, can you unmute yourself, please? Certainly, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, I need to respond to the comment that Ms. Graham Days made. Um, let me make, be very clear about uh, two things. Uh, as the mayor said, we were informed of this meeting at seven o'clock in the morning, I think uh, Friday. Um, so I attended, I had no idea what other members of the public, the DTC, whatever would be there. And you are correct that um, as uh, Mr. Garcia and Mr. Rivers did show up. Uh, when I was there, Mr. Dave, Greg Davis was there also conferring with the mayor. So I believe he was also invited to the to the event, so I don't, uh, I, I, I know nothing about that, uh, nor do I have anything to do with any comments by Mr. Garcia, Mr. Cornell Lewis, or anyone who commented the thing. I think the mayor implied that um, I was somehow uh, agreeing or disagreeing with um, the comments Mr. Garcia, or you made, or Mr. Garcia made, uh, one of the things the mayor did say, however, that is, it, that is inaccurate and, you know, it needs to be said that is one with the charge he was making with respect, I think, specifically to one of the ad hoc committees um, was that uh, ultimately the council, you know, it was not just the mayor, but the mayor and the council. Uh, I can honestly say that I virtually had no input in the library building committee and that that was my only reaction to the entire event. Thank you. So once again, if you go back, uh, Councillor Goff, and you look at the videotape from the news media, you can definitely see yourself shaking. Um, I did state that the council committees, the ones that the council appoint, 
is approved by the nine member of the council, the building committee for the library, I appointed, but the council was also very aware of those appointees. So the shaking of the head, you can definitely go back and look at the video. That's the age that we live in. Everything is captured on camera. Um, uh, it, it, Madam Mayor, uh, it, it is captured. It is captured on camera, and I just want to make sure. I was shaking my head because of the statement that the council uh, 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 had any role in approving those appointments. We so, were aware of it, but we did not have any role in approving. Thank so you. So once again, look at the video and look at the time that you started shaking your head. Uh, Deputy Mayor? Yes, Madam Mayor. I. I, I... I'm a little uh, uncomfortable with the, with the way we're proceeding here with people shaking their heads and that's a reason to call them out on something. I think we have to rise above that and stick to the fact of what's been said and what's going on and move on and not make this the major thing that we're going to accomplish tonight. I don't think- So once again, sir, point. the only reason why we're having a back and forth about this is because Councilor Goff is trying to prove a point and I'm saying to him that he can go ahead and look at the camera. This is not the major focus of this event. That was not even the major focus of my statement. Well, I know it had to do with the library board and it was an appointment. I understand that. I'm not sure it went through committee on committees, but it got approved by the council, as you say. But there, there's, there's some, there's some, we'll have to go back and look at how it was done. But uh, and that's and I'm not standing up for Mr. Mr. Garcia. I just, uh, I just not happy with people marking people who are shaking their heads or who are smiling or making gestures while other things goes on and that's reason to call them out. That's okay, fine. thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Wong? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm just um, agreeing with your last statement in regards to the purpose of this current agenda. I would advocate that we move along and we do have uh, quite a bit of attendees. So, um, and I think that is the meat of why they um, attended today. So if we could move on to the next item, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chief, uh, um, Mr. Klein is asking um, if we know our death toll for COVID-19 here in Bloomfield. I want to say- uh, I have to, If you give me a second, I will look up the stats. I don't have them readily available. I think it's about between 83 and 85 um, at the last that may be correct. The stats came out at Thursday and um, I, I can look them up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, just move on and then we'll get back to the chief. Um, new business 1920-55, consider and take action regarding transfer appropriations within the 2019-2020 budget amended. Um, Carrie, do I see her? I do. <laughs> Carrie. Okay. Do you want me to share my screen, um, Mayor? That'd be fine. Okay, so um, per section 908 of the town charter, the council may approve any transfers um, from department to department that the, the department in itself can't fund. Um, at this time, there are nine different requests um, that I am asking transfers be approved for tonight. Um, I'll just take a brief moment and go through all of them quickly and then take questions after. So the first transfer that I am requesting is for debt service. We have an interest payment on a uh, band issuance that we um, need to pay. That will be completely offset by um, premium from that band of $84,000. So the transfer for the interest on debt service is $86,862. 
The next transfer um, that I am requesting is to fund the town 401 retirement contributions um, in fiscal year 2020's budget. About $38,000 per pay period was budgeted, but we are averaging about $48,000 per pay period. Um, therefore, I need about $150,000 to fund um, three, three pay periods, um, which are remaining. The next transfer are for Juniper Lane and Wadham Road stabilization. These were items in the fiscal year 2021 capital project. They were taken out in the hopes that we could find funding for them this year. Um, Juniper Lane is $16,325 and Wadham Road is $25,000. Um, the next request is $43,000. It is for safety improvements for COVID. Uh, Public Works did a great job putting temporary um, safety improvements in all of the town public facing buildings, um, departments rather. We, um, we did have a contractor come in and look at more permanent solutions, but because we're uncertain of really the, the next wave when it's coming, um, we are hesitant to implement those um, permanent solutions, but I think it would be smart while we have the funding to put it aside in this current year budget um, with the possibility that we will be reimbursed for it through um, federal and state funding um, in fiscal year 2021. The next item is for Wheeler Park guardrails. It is $40,000. This project has been identified by Leisure Service and Public Works. Let me just scroll down. Um, and it will help keep vehicles from entering the park because there is a barrier that would exist. Um, a gu guide rail would also frame the park and increase curb appeal and hopefully um, increase usage of this park. The next request is for the Bloomfield Board of Education. They had numerous requests in the fiscal year 2021 budget. All of them are postponed due to, as you guys know, a tight fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, the original plan was for the Board of Ed to take advantage of one of the older tr trucks that Public Works had. Um, after speaking with Wayne, this vehicle that we had identified as 11 years old and it does need repair. Um, Wayne, Wayne, the facilities director from the Board of Education really needs a vehicle with a utility bo body that allows for secure transport of a large variety of materials and tools. Um, he has had a, um, uh, a truck with just a cap on it, um, but his experience is that it hasn't worked, that the, the time spent on frequently changing the tools and materials was just not efficient or effective. The next request is for Public Works Heavy Equipment. Um, originally, they came in fiscal year 2021 asking for $421,000. Um, that was basically eliminated um, with $275,000. They would be able to get a plow truck and a backhoe. The plow truck schedule right now for replacement is a 15 year rotation that has already been pushed out um, to 17 years. And if we don't fund this request, it will be um, an additional year. The backhoe would um, replace a 2005 Caterpillar with over 5,000 hours of use. And we've you know, spent over the past few years, $50,000 just to keep it um, um, working properly. The second to last request is for $32,000 for the demo of 194 Terry Plains Road. Um, which is next to the Wintonberry Hills golf course. This was an addition um, made by the finance com committee at our June 15th meeting. The last request of the night was um, to increase the town manager budget $25,000. As you guys know, we um, hired a new town manager in September. We had um, the retiring town manager work through a trans transitional period um, that was not budgeted for. And also there was a new vehicle stipend um, for the new town manager that was not previously budgeted for. So, so total, the total transfer requests are $740,187,000, but they don't increase the fiscal year 2020 budget of 91,847,000 
$821. Oh. So I was- Madam Mayor, I move to accept these transfers. Is there a second? So I see, I see, I see Joe and I see Patrick. I'm not quite sure what Joe is doing, but I see both of them. Uh, Joe, ha you have a question, Joe? Okay, unmute yourself. You gotta unmute yourself. Okay, go ahead. I just want this Wheeler Park, is that Samuel Wheeler Reed Park? <clears throat> And, and if it is, I would suggest we stop using the name Wheeler for it. I was a Confederate general, if anybody cares. Anyway. And also, I was going to ask, did we, why we chose to knock down the, the golf course house instead of, say, the um, behind the library, the uh, Riley building. I thought we were going to knock that down. Has that been... Is that scheduled to be knocked down or budget to be knocked down or what's the story on that? So the uh, Riley Lumber site is not currently scheduled to be locked, um, I mean, knocked down at this time. Um, we, um, the finance committee did identify $444,000 of current um, available balance in, in projects that have already been approved. Um, that is something that you guys could revisit it, in fiscal year 2021, if it is something that the finance committee so, and the council want to move forward. So that half a million dollars is in addition to what we're doing now. Right, correct. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm in favor of the motion. <laughs> Councilor Wong. Thank you. Um, uh, Robert or Carrie, can you guys expand on some of the updates that we're considering in addition to what we have already enforced from a COVID-19 protection standpoint? Um, and I don't know, um, bringing this up again, and I didn't go to the last finance meeting as I don't sit on that board, but I'm not sure if the options of bringing in that extra reinforced Kevlar is still on the table. Um, I would like to see additional justification if it is, um, but I don't, I don't really support that. It's pretty expensive. And what's wrong with the, the barriers that we have now? Are, are you talking about, are you talking about the expansion for the tax yeah. office? Yeah, Carrie. Met, yeah, that. And then Carrie mentioned um, that the uh, departments that face uh, public uh, are looking into options to reinforce that protection. So I just wanted to know if we know what those some of those options are and why what we have now isn't sufficient. So I, I will say that the Kevlar is no longer being looked at for the tax department. Um, for safety improvements and either is bullet uh, resistant glass. Um, so that is currently off the table. Um, I think, you know, maybe Robert can speak better to this, but we had Gordian Group come in and kind of assess all the buildings. I know that there needs to be some um, like more major improvements maybe to the register of voters to really, because that office is so tight um, to social distance is just not really, not really a thing. And there isn't anything, um, really wrong with the what public works did now it would just be these would be more of a a year or more improvement so they would you know they wouldn't they would be a little they would be fixated to the wall as opposed to just you know the wood the wood framed um um fixtures that they have now so and it, it's not something that we um, have to do, but it would be reimbursable um by the cares and um fema so Awesome. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Um, 1920 56, consider and take action regarding adoption of resolution tax uh, suspense list. So move, Madam Mayor. Is there a second? Councilor Goff, second that? Any discussions? Deputy Mayor, you got to uh, unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I know that uh, what I was reading through here, there was a clear statement that there was no indication that we, because we're moving this to the suspense list, 
there's no reason to believe we are not going to still try and collect these fees. <clears throat> but I was wondering what process the town is in with regard to leaning the properties that have had these fees for so long and what stage, how, how are we going about that? Rather than just, are we just doing a financial, um, uh, putting put in a different category or tell, can you just respond, please? Sure. So um, uh, the tax collector um, liens the property according to state statute, and she will continue to lien the property as she can on all the ones that we are putting in suspense. We can still um, do a tax sale on all the all the items that we are putting in suspense. We're really just doing a record record keeping of just transferring it from an accounts receivable to a reserve for um, um, uncollectibles, but. Um, we still mail letters, the motor vehicle still goes to collections, the collection agency will work to, to receive um, to get to get the funding. So efforts are, are still con continuing on all the, the um, properties identified in the attachment. Thank you for that additional clarification. Sure. Any other questions? All in favor? All right. Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Um, Brad, we have 83 deaths in Bloomfield so far, and um, most of them are coming from the assisted living facility. One of the problems that we're having with the COVID-19 testing and reporting is the ethnic background. So we do know that Blacks are um, higher proportion but we also know that there's about 47% um, of uh, information that we really can't tell the racial um, makeup of that. So I think in some ways we are at a deficit because of that nut that we can't decipher. Um, but one of the things that um, the underlying factors, whether the person had um, diabetes, heart disease, whatever, is, is what's also um, exacerbating the COVID-19 death rate. So with the health district wanting to do a study as far as um, health and, and health related issues in our town, I think that will also be helpful to us. Um, not now, but I do believe that once we get that information, we will be able to do a little bit better um, taking care of our, our residents. Councillor Curtin, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanna to add to that. I also believe it's important, because I know early in the process, uh, I, I did mention that it's important for, for us to be in communication with those uh, nursing home, retirement homes. And it's just not a Bloomfield issue. I think it's statewide. I think the governor did pass an executive order to you know, demand that those facilities communicate with the state uh, and there's a lot of um, layers with how that communication gets back to the state at the state level and then back to the town. So hopefully in the, in the future months, there could be some sort of coordination where at least we're collaborating with those facilities and knowing sometimes some of their needs or expectations that we can help facilitate uh, from a local level uh, townwide. So um, Brad Klein said, I thank you for the record. The death toll per capita here in Bloomfield is 10 times the national average and three times the state average. Um, and the, I think the state average is three times the national average. Is this something we need to look at? Yes, it is, Brad. And yes, we will be looking at it. So I think I've answered all those questions. So we're going to go back to 1920 dash uh, 54, I'm assuming it, say, it says 55, but I think it should say 54, discussion concerning recent town events um, slash racism. We did have a special meeting on last week. There were some questions that were asked that um, only the uh, chief would be able to answer. The chief is here this evening. I believe that he has a, he had a list of the questions that were asked. And I believe that he has answers for those. I just want to give a little bit of background for those two may not have been here. We did have two issues in our town which were vile and disgusting. Um, uh, 
um, Mr. Pleasant, the there are testing sites here in Bloomfield. Anyone can go and get tested. I'm not quite sure that the Board of Ed is making anyone get tested, but any of our residents can go and get tested. There were two sites last week at the um, First Cathedral. There will be a site, I'm sorry, I just saw a question. There will be a site on July 8th at the um, Human Services Building. I believe it will actually be on the Carmen A. Ray side of the Human Services Building. Um, you can come out and get tested. Anyone, you don't need a doctor's note just need some identification and they will test you. So um, in a couple, a couple weeks ago, we had two racial incidents, one where a young boy was called the N-word through um, while walking around in Silas Dean Pond. The other where a black man had a gun pulled on him by a white man claiming to be neighborhood watch. I believe that both of those gentlemen have been arrested. The one with the gun being pulled started out as a misdemeanor. It's now a felony charge. So we're glad that they have seen that the charges needed to be changed. And we're gonna obviously wait and see, make sure that the person is prosecuted. But I know that there are questions that were asked. So I'm gonna let the chief start. And then if you have further questions, please go ahead and uh, put it in your Q&A box. At my cue, Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wanted to say a few things and give a brief or, or a statement uh, before I answered some of those questions. And I think many of those questions will be answered within the context of that statement. Um, first, I'd like to say good evening to, uh, to all of you, uh, in particular, the mayor, the me members of council and the public that are joining us. I'd like to start by apologizing for any misunderstanding that led to my absence uh, from last Tuesday's meeting. I certainly understand and I appreciate the value of all of your time. Um, and I'm very sorry that it was not maximized during last week's meeting. I believe that uh, in the nine years that I've been chief, I've demonstrated certainly a willingness to participate in an open and transparent discussion of the issues that concern uh, the council and the community. And I certainly remain uh, ready and engaged in those discussions tonight and as we move forward. Um, I reviewed the record of last Tuesday's meeting and understand that there are important questions uh, that were asked by members of the council um, and the community. Following the death of George Floyd, the two incidents that we had in our community and the subsequent questions that were asked uh, in our public safety meeting of June. Um, in an effort to maximize some of our limited time this evening, uh, I'd like to address some of these issues as well as uh, review those two case, cases um, and the actions of the police department and answer any additional questions from council or members of the community in attendance tonight. First, um, I think it would be beneficial to describe many of the things that I've implemented at the police department in our effort to become nationally recognized as an agency that is progressive in our policing techniques. I had um, intended to provide my update to all of you yesterday morning. I thought I was successful in sending that out. Um, however, I had an error um, working remotely. I've discussed with Scott Charlo, we're gonna try and correct that going forward. But I think I sent it out to everyone at noon today. I hope that uh, many of you uh, had an opportunity to review that. Um, if you didn't, um, it has a lot of primary source material uh, that supports many of the, the questions that are being asked by council um, and the public. Um, for those of you who have not had an opportunity to review, uh, eight years ago, um, after becoming chief, for about a year, I initiated the process of examining all of our policies and procedures and practices at the police department to ensure that not only were we doing things that were legally justified, but we were also engaging in best practices in the profession of policing, that we were sensitive to our community expectations um, and acting in the best interests of improving the quality of life for residents of Bloomfield. That was my charge when I was hired. Um, and that was something that I fully engaged uh, and still engage in today. I initiated that process, not alone in my office, but um, by meeting with the town manager at the time, Mr. Louis Chapman. Um, members of the town council, um, which I believe there's only one remaining at this point, um, council members, uh, again, businesses, um, 
and I developed a, a strategic operating plan for the Bloomfield Police Department and outlined eight uh, really broad goals for us over the following three to five years. Among those areas of concentration uh, were the mission of the police department, our operating principles, the, uh, and the police department policies and procedures, which are really the, the roadmap for how we deliver service in the community. Those policies were updated at the time to reflect uh, relevant federal law uh, and applicable state law best practices in, in policing. Sorry, we have motion detected and lights uh, to save energy here at the police department. So you're going to see me waving uh, erratically from time to time, and I apologize for that. I'm not swatting at anything. Um, following the, um, the initial drafts of those policies, they were reviewed and edited by uh, subject matter experts and legal experts, as well as a mandatory process where we meet with the union and review all of them. As a result, uh, we implemented a completely new policy manual here, 110 policies and procedures. We trained all staff uh, in general meetings in the new method of operations, and we began uh, a comprehensive process of inspections to ensure that we were accountable throughout the organization to fulfilling those new policies here at the police department. Uh, on a really fast track, um, two years later, uh, in a process that normally takes uh, three to five years, we applied for and received accreditation in the fall of 2015 by the Commission on Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies. As many of you know, and you've heard me, heard me talk about in the past, that's an internationally recognized professional accreditation agency developed in 1979 by the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and the Police Executive Research Forum, of which I'm a member. Um, it's common refer, commonly referred to by the acronym CALEA, and you'll see that quite a bit. Um, it's really the preeminent accrediting agency in the world, and it's recognized for its extremely high standards in inspecting and approving affiliated police agencies. Our police department was recognized in November of 2015 for meeting 500 standards of compliance with that accrediting agency, and we received the highest level of approval, advanced accreditation, that only 2% of police departments in our nation have achieved. Um, a few years later, in 2017, um, not resting on our laurels, uh, I again challenged the department to continuously improve our level of service to the community in the wake of a lot of high-profile um, racial incidents that were happening across the country. And I developed the 2017 strategic plan, building off of that initial concept and that initial three to five year plan. We re again reformed many of our policies and our core philosophies to reflect changes that were identified nationally by President Barack Obama's task force on 21st century policing, which you've probably heard quite a bit of talk about lately in the news. And we really further committed ourselves at the time to community policing in Bloomfield. Um, I previously outlined a lot of those changes in memorandums to council uh, when you first took over uh, last year. Um, and I recently wrote an op-ed for the Bloomfield Messenger a few weeks ago in the wake of George Floyd's death, describing some of the core uh, foundations of that philosophy. During the, the summer of 2019, just last summer, um, we had CALEA officials here in Bloomfield conducting a complete inspection of the police department. That inspection consisted of a thorough review, again, of all of our policies and procedures to ensure compliance with those mandatory standards. The two officials that came reviewed our citizen surveys that we conduct on a yearly basis, and they went the extra step of contacting many of the survey recipients to ensure the validity of those surveys. They then rode along with officers on patrol. They interviewed the citizens when they were out there regarding their perception of the police department. And they held an open community meeting here at the PD with an open phone line uh, so that residents could call in to solicit, so that the accreditors could solicit input from the public on their perception of the police department. As a result, um, the inspector's final report to the CALEA Commission described the Bloomfield Police Department as highly progressive, uh, committed, and engaged to the concept of community policing, 
um, from the police chief uh, to the officers in the field. Um, they also committed or commented rather on the high level of community confidence in the police department and the positive feedback that uh, they received from our community members. As a result of that inspection and the final report, we again received unanimous approval um, in Cincinnati this past November at the national conference. And it was really a validation that many of the things we're doing here we're doing correctly, or at least according to best practices in the profession. Um, I don't wanna just talk about those foundational elements. That's not why we're here tonight. Um, I'd like to address some of the recent concerns from the town council and our community uh, that were identified in last week's meeting. Um, the answers to many of those questions and concerns frankly can be found in our department policies and operating procedures, which are not glamorous, um, but they contain a lot of that information. Five of those policies are found on the department's webpage. And if citizens who are watching tonight or uh, see this on YouTube in the future, if you go to the webpage and you look on the left-hand column under the, the uh, general orders tab, it's about three quarters of the way down in the left-hand column, um, you'll see that the topic general orders, those, those five core policies um, have been posted since the creation of that website. Um, four of those are, are posted in compliance with our accreditation standards. They're bias-based policing, uh, use of force, how to make a citizen complaint, and the employee misconduct and internal affairs policy. Basically, what uh, a code of what officers do that is unacceptable and how we investigate that uh, within our collective bargaining, bargaining agreement with the union. I provided those um, to you in the email yesterday and this morning. Yesterday's was a little kind of frazzled, so don't read that one. The one this morning had all that material. Um, the first two policies uh, that I included uh, answer a lot of the questions that we're gonna talk about. The bias-based policing policy um, defines and outlines the police department's prohibitions against racial or bias-based action taken by officers primarily during traffic stops. That's really what the foundation of that policy was, but it also covers interactions with citizens and most importantly, uh, any enforcement action taken by officers in this department. It, the, it describes the requirements of all of our officers to provide motorists with information at the conclusion of all motor vehicle stops, outlining the process by which a motorist can file a complaint with the police department if they feel they were stopped due to racial or other biases. All officers are trained in that policy as part of their yearly bias-based policing training that I discussed at the last public safety meeting. In addition, um, the department conducts a yearly inspection and review of all traffic stops and complaints of bias-based stops or actions. And in compliance with Connecticut general statutes or the law here in Connecticut, we report that information to the Chief State's Attorney's Office in Rocky Hill and the African American Affairs Commission. Um, that's mandated by, by state statute. The police department's use of force policy was developed in compliance with relevant uh, Supreme Court decisions, state of Connecticut law, uh, and recognized best practices in law enforcement training. The standards uh, the procedures and the prohibitions were further developed in coordination with, with what's called POST or the Police Officer Standards and Training Division. That's the, the agency in the state that certifies all police officers. And we went one further step in having uh, an, a local attorney, Elliot Spector, who is known throughout the state and the nation as a recognized expert in police practices and, and policies to review that, um, that policy. And we do an annual review with him to make sure that we're up on the, the most current language policies uh, and, and procedures regarding use of force. It, that policy outlines the parameters in which an officer is justified in using force to control a situation, um, to affect an arrest of a person, to overcome the, anyone's resistance to arrest, or to defend themselves or another person from harm. It further describes the level of force to be used and any prohibitions against excessive force and the reporting requirements mandated by state law and our department guidelines. I wanna emphasize that 
Bloomfield police officers are trained and authorized to use force on what we call a progressive scale. That means that officers can only use the level of force which is reasonably necessary to control a situation, to effect an arrest, to overcome the resistance, as I described to that arrest, or to defend themselves or another person from harm. When force is, is necessary to be used in a situation, officers are trained that the degree of that force that an officer may employ has to be in direct relationship to the amount of resistance that is being offered. They can't be excessive um, in that force. And it has to be um, in direct relationship to the immediate threat that the officer faces. In addition, um, our Bloomfield police officers, as I described in the last public safety meeting at, at detail and in emails, um, are trained in de-escalation techniques. And we focus uh, primarily on communication as a method of control rather than physical force as a method of compliance. Uh, Bloomfield police officers are authorized to use deadly physical force under, under guidelines that are established by uh, the Supreme Court and state law in Connecticut when one or both of the following situations comply. I'm gonna read from this. Uh, to defend themselves or a third person from what the officer reasonably believes to be the use or imminent use of deadly physical force, to prevent the escape of a fleeing felon, who the officer reasonably believes poses an immediate threat or death to, of death or serious physical injury to the officer or others. And when feasible, the officer has given a warning uh, to that individual of his intent to use that deadly force or to stop an animal that uh, is a threat to the officer or another person, which um, happens very rarely. Uh, Bloomfield Police, the Bloomfield Police Department rather does not condone or train officers in the intentional use of chokeholds or any other method of restraint applied to the neck area of another person, including, but not limited to an arm bar hold, a carotid artery hold, a lateral vascular neck restraint or any neck restraint or hold with a knee. The use of a chokehold or a neck restraint will only be approved in situations where the officer faces deadly physical force being used against them. Um, the state has recently required that we um, update our policy with a clear prohibition against this, uh, uh, against chokeholds. Um, it's been clearly outlined uh, in post standards and we issued that prohibition uh, when we got that immediately. Um, Bloomfield police officers are restricted from using deadly force in certain situations. Those restrictions are you can't discharge your weapon from or at a moving vehicle unless the person in the vehicle is an immediate threat to the officer or another person with deadly physical force. Um, the moving vehicle itself does not constitute a threat that justifies an officer's use of, of deadly force. An officer threatened by an oncoming vehicle has to make every effort to move out of the vehicle's path. And if the officer reasonably believes that they can't do so, uh, and they're at imminent risk of serious physical injury or death, then the officer may, at, in that case, discharge their firearm at the driver uh, of the vehicle in an effort to stop or divert it. We cannot shoot warning shots. Uh, or shots as calls for assistance. Those are strictly prohibited. And um, officers may not discharge a weapon when they have reason to believe that innocent people in the line of fire um, may be injured. Bloomfield police officers, in addition, are required to report all use of force incidents to their immediate supervisor and complete a report documenting the circumstances under which force is used. In addition, officers are required to intervene and notify a supervisor if they encounter another officer utilizing force that is excessive. All incidents in which force is used by a Bloomfield police officer are reviewed by our professional standards division and our training division. The operation captain, operations captain, Captain Hydash, does a monthly review of those. Um, and I also conduct a further review of all use of force incidents by members of this department and I report on those and have reported on those on a monthly basis to the town council public safety committee. Now, I understand that there are several questions and concerns expressed regarding the police department's arrest procedures and the application of the criminal charges resulting from recent police investigations and the assignment of bonds. So let me just talk to that 
briefly, police officers are authorized to make an arrest based on a standard that we call probable cause. It's defined as a set of facts and circumstances that would lead a reasonable police officer to believe that a crime has been committed. Sorry for my frantic waving. The standard is, is much higher than a mere belief or a hunch or a suspicion. It's got to be rooted in the facts of an incident, and then it has to be outlined clearly in the police officer's investigation. Bloomfield police officers are trained in relevant Connecticut laws and the elements of the criminal, criminal code to determine what acts constitute a crime. If they determine based on their training, experience, and a review of that code, that the crime has been committed, then they have the authority to make an arrest. To assist them, um, each police officer carries with them a criminal code book. It's commonly referred to in police circles as the law enforcement officer's field manual, or the red book is kind of the slang. Uh, this manual outlines all the, the criminal violations in the state of Connecticut. Um, police officers often uh, will review the elements of a crime. They may believe they know what fits, but they'll often have to refer to, to this book to review the elements of the crime to determine um, what violation is to be cited in a particular situation. Police officers also have to determine whether they have the authority to make an arrest based on a warrant application to the court. You've heard me talk about that quite a bit or an on scene or a, what we refer to as a warrantless arrest. That, that determine is made, determination rather is made by uh, based on the severity of the crime, the timeline in which the event happened and other relevant factors. For the, for the purposes of answering the questions tonight, I'm referring to the warrantless arrest procedure or when a police officer makes an on-scene arrest of a person. In these circumstances, an officer is further guided by the severity of the crime, state statute uh, and superior court directives. In relation to the Ryefield Hollow North incident. At the time of the arrest in relation to the crimes that were reported to us on June 7th, the Bloomfield Police Department was and is currently operating under a modified arrest guideline policy. As a result of precautions enacted in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the police department is, has been required to make significant changes to our detention and processing practices in order to safeguard our employees and the general public. Um, the current operating procedure for the police department following the directions we got from Superior Court have been to limit detention and processing practices of people who are arrested um, on a warrantless uh, field arrest to class A and B felonies. Um, for those who don't understand what that is, those are crimes such as murder, robbery, uh, sexual assault, um, larceny in the first degree, very serious crimes. We also have, have uh, some leeway on that in instances where the identity of the person who's being arrested is in question or their place of residence is, is simply unknown. And in all other cases, with the exception of domestic violence charges, the accused person is to be issued a promise to appear or a non-surety bond in accordance with the, superior, with the Superior Court approved bond parameters that we operate under. On June 7th, the investigating officer and the shift supervisor evaluated the, the facts and um, statements of the victims and the witness and preliminarily determined that Mr. Michael Fannin had committed the crimes of disorderly conduct in the second and interfering with the investigation of a police officer. Following the court's guidelines, uh, the supervisor ordered uh, that they issue a summons to appear in court. Uh, the date was about two weeks later and he required a $1,500 non-surety bond. The shift supervisor further determined that night that due to Mr. Fannin's statements to the officers, which I believe I supplied that report to all of you, um, that is his Connecticut firearms permit and all firearms in his possession should be seized and that a racial and bias based crime report should be filed with the court. On the morning of Monday 8th, the very next morning, because remember June 7th was a, was a Sunday evening. 
Um, on the next morning, June 8th, the shift supervisor followed up the investigation by contacting the state's attorney's office to discuss the status of the case. He discussed the appropriateness of the charges that they had levied against Mr. Fannin, and he began the process with the investigating officer of applying for a seizure warrant to retain the possession of the accused firearms that we had seized the night before. We're required, if we're going to keep them for any length of time, to apply for that seizure warrant to the, of, from the court. The supervisor was informed at that point that the charges were appropriate at the present time and, he was, and, and that they would further be reviewed by the state's attorney prior to Mr. Fannin's court date. And, and remember that the Superior Court is operating under modified timelines and guidelines as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The investigating and, and shift supervisor then completed a seizure warrant for Mr. Fannin's firearms to ensure that they were secured in his court appearance or until his court appearance. And the initial warrant to seize the firearms was denied um, by the prosecutor assigned to the case. I then made a request uh, to state's attorney Gail Hardy uh, that she review the, the case. Um, and it was later approved by a judge of the Superior Court. In addition, the supervisor uh, at my direction contacted the State uh, of Connecticut Special Licensing and Firearms Unit and submitted a request for revocation of Mr. Fannin's permit and supplied a full copy of our investigative report and the seizure affidavit. Um, I know that that was a question that was offered in last week's meeting. As a result of our continued efforts with the state's attorney over the next meeting or over the next week and in meetings uh, with state's attorney Gail Hardy, uh, the criminal charges in the case were increased on the suspect or the accused court date of June 17th to threatening in the first degree and an additional charge of intimidation based on bigotry or bias in the second degree was added. Both of those charges are classified as class D felonies. The third charge uh, that we had originally placed of interfering with a police investigation was not, was not changed at that point. It is uh, classified as a class A misdemeanor. For clarification to members of the public and, and, the, and the council, interfering with a police officer is the appropriate charge to address a suspect's uh, repeated lies to investigating officers at the scene while they're investigating. It's not the charge of making a false statement. Making a false statement is a charge that applies to a written sworn statement that is provided uh, to officers during an investigation or during, during the course of an investigation. This uh, past Saturday, I provided an update on the status of the investigation uh, into a complaint that I, that I received via email from Miss, I believe it's called, pronounced Marvian Duncan. Is that correct? Um, Ms. Duncan contacted me via email dated Friday, June 5th, to inform me of a very disturbing experience that she and her young son had while shopping at the Silas Dean Pawn Shop the previous evening. I reviewed the email on the morning of June 6th, that was a Saturday morning, and immediately ordered an investigation of the incident. I assigned uh, the department's senior detective and crime, uh, child crime specialist to investigate the matter. The investigation uh, began later that morning and continued until just this past Friday. Uh, working in coordination with an inspector of the state's attorney's office and state's attorney Gail Hardy herself, uh, Detective Layupa interviewed Ms. Duncan. She interviewed the store clerk uh, and the suspect who was identified as Mr. David Feifner of Granby, Connecticut. She also reviewed a video of the incident captured on the store's surveillance system. Um, Detective Layupa initially completed an arrest warrant charging the suspect with breach of peace and risk of injury to a minor, which is a class C felony. That request was denied by the court uh, based upon direction provided by the state's attorney's office to the investigating uh, detective. A subsequent arrest warrant application was later submitted charging the suspect with two counts of breach of peace and was approved on Friday. Um, Detective Layupa and officers served that arrest warrant on Mr. Feifner Friday evening. Following those same Superior Court uh, protocols that I described to you earlier, um, 
in response to the, to the, to the pandemic. The accused was issued a summons to appear in court and a $1,000 non-surety bond. His court appearance date is scheduled for July 6th. Um, both of these investigations remain active and the criminal prosecutions are scheduled at Superior Court in Hartford. During the, so that's it for those two incidents. I just wanna address one last thing. Um, and that is that during the last uh, Town Council Public Safety Committee meeting uh, held on June 8th, uh, a few committee members began a discussion of the Eight Can't Wait campaign, which is from, from what I understand of it from reading is a national uh, social advocacy movement uh, advocating for changes to existing police practices across the nation. Um, I'm certainly not an expert. I'm not gonna address the entire campaign, but I'd just like to focus briefly in the next one minute uh, before I conclude on the eight specific policy initiatives, initiatives for restricting um, excessive police use of force and the relationship to our policies here in Bloomfield. The, the first policy initiative that they advocate is banning chokeholds and strangleholds. As I explained in detail, in my review of our use of, policy, of, of force policy, the Bloomfield Police Department does not condone and we don't train our officers in the use of chokeholds or any other method of restraint applied to a suspect's neck uh, or, or the neck of any person. That policy has been issued to every member of this department um, and we will update our use of force policy in, in coordination with state standards um, we put out a temporary one. We're going to update that immediately. Uh, the pol second policy initiative by the Eight Can't Wait uh, initiative is requiring de-escalation. As I described earlier, uh, our officers are trained in de-escalation techniques and required by our policy to use only that amount of force that is reasonably necessary to overcome resistance. And that would include communication as the first step. Um, it requires the policy initiative from it can't wait requires warnings before shooting. Um, our officers are authorized to use deadly force to protect themselves or others from what they reasonably believe to be the imminent use of deadly physical force. They're also authorized to use force to prevent the escape from a fleeing felon when the officer reasonably believes that that person is going to commit uh, or, or a threat to death or serious physical injury to another person or to the officer. In those cases, they have to give warnings, but deadly physical force is an imminent threat to the officer or somebody else. The policy initiatives from A Can Wait require police to exhaust all, all alternatives before shooting. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, police officers in Bloomfield are trained under a policy of progressive use of force. Um, we're only authorized to use a level of force which is reasonable and necessary to control a situation or affect an arrest or overcome any resistance. Um, when force is necessary, it has to be a degree of force that an officer um, uses in direct relationship to the amount of resist resistance that's being offered. Um, policy initiative number five is a duty to intervene. I explained that we mandate our and train our officers to intervene and notify a super, a supervisor whenever they encounter another officer using force that is excessive. It bans shooting at, at motor vehicles. I outlined that earlier. Police officers are prohibited from discharging a firearm at or from a moving vehicle unless the, the person believes that the, or the officer believes that the vehicle is an immediate threat to the officer or another person and only under strict protocols. It requires a use of force continuum. Um, in, in progressive police agencies, we haven't seen use of force continuums in the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, we, offer, we, we operate again uh, under a policy of de-escalation and progressive use of force. So we found in, in progressive police agencies that a continuum or a matrix often confuses the officer into responding with a certain level of force rather than trying to only escalate up a, up a chain in reaction to a suspect's um, amount of force that's being directed towards the officer. It, re it requires comprehensive reporting. Um, Bloomfield police officers are required by policy to report any and all uses of force to their immediate supervisor and they have to complete a use of force report 
uh, as well as an incident report. And again, I review those uh, and report on those to the Public Safety Committee uh, every month. Um, I, listen, I, I've been here nine years. I, I pride myself and the department on I'm waving my hands at lights, um, on being a, a transparent organization. Um, as I've said in every public safety meeting, we are fully committed to the concept of community policing and problem solving, working in partnership with our residents and our business owners. I've always been accessible and honest in my responses, and I'm prepared tonight to answer questions and uh, whatever I can uh, for information, giving the ongoing prosecution of those two cases, as well as questions regarding our policies and procedures. So I, I hope that that information helped you and I stand ready to answer. So I do see some hands raised, but I'm gonna ask a question that's in our Q&A. Um, Mr. Reed asks, what is the repercussion for failure to report the use of excessive force? Uh, discipline uh, in the police department. They would fall under the, we would do an investigation of that um, and they would get uh, discipline, discipline commensurate with what the offense was. If they failed to report a use of force, that would be up to and including termination. We have a question. I'm sorry. I just said plain and simple. That's completely unacceptable. Okay. Lorraine asks, going forward, what can we do to mitigate racist acts mar masked um, the vigilante style of un unauthorized community policing? Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. I, I think that would be in relation to kind of like the, 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 the neighborhood watch style um, policing. Um, we, at, at, here in Bloomfield, we have a, a, a block watch organization. Uh, it meets the second Wednesday of every month. Um, officer Wilkins, our community service officer, provides a briefing uh, similar to what I provide to the um, public safety committee on statistics that happened over the month. Uh, and then we listen to incidents or concerns from citizens in town so that we can apply resources towards, I hate to keep saying it, but as I said earlier, towards solving problems, uh, improving the quality of life in neighborhoods. We do not have any affiliated neighborhood watch um, programs. Um, we conduct that monthly block watch. Uh, the Blue Hills Ave Association of Pershing Park, Mr. Uh, Riggs uh, and the group there, they have their own block watch um, and we meet and assist with them. And I believe that the Ryefield Hollow North or the, the Senate Farms neighborhood has a monthly meeting. Um, they actually, they, it actually takes place here at the police department um, where they talk about a number of issues, but we don't participate in any type of neighborhood watch um, with that group either. Um, Councillor Wong, can you unmute yourself, please? Councillor Curtin, I don't know if you had your hand. Oh, okay, so you'll be after Councillor Wong. Councillor Wong, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for elaborating um, in such detail with the current cases and some of the policy that we have in the department. And I know that in public safety, which a committee that which I sit, I've been advocating, I know we do have de-escalation policies within our police department and we do have that training, but it is standard. And I think that we can implement or execute something above that standard and really go the extra mile to make sure that we um, dig into any other uh, resources and training that would enhance our current de-escalation training program for our officers. So I'll continue to advocate um, for that. Um, I would challenge the use of force continuum. I know that you have, I would ask that maybe we take that into public safety, Councillor Goff, and maybe take a deeper dive into what that looks like, why the pros and cons for Bloomfield specifically. Um, and uh, let's see, I would also um, ask for an analysis on the use of force um, and the demographics associated with that use of force, as opposed to when is that, what side of towns does that happen? East, West, North, South. I would like to see kind of how that lays out. I know that may take some time. So um, please consider that um, as a um, part of a report. Um, and then um, I just have one question and then I'll let it, I'll let other counselors go because I have a, a ton more. 
Um, and I know Lynette Eastman had uh, made a question or input a question on the Q&A section as far as when are we going to expect Michael Fanning's mugshot? Since from what I understand, because it, it was a misdemeanor, that is why a mugshot wasn't taken. And now that the charges have been upped to a felony charge, that warrants a mugshot. Is, can you no, I, I, and, and I, I just tried to describe that in my, in my comments. The, the court has put down guidelines in response to the COVID-19 pandemic that we are not to bring in and process anyone unless it is an A or B felony, or we don't know the identity of the suspect, or we don't know their location of residence. In all other cases, we are to issue a written promise to appear um, and a court date assigned to the case. The court is operating under those, has been operating under those modified guidelines since the end of March. So okay. we operated under those guidelines. So when the charges were changed at court, I believe it was the 17th, um, Mr. Fannin's court date, th there is no process at the state's attorney's office. I checked on that um, when you sent me that email. Um, there, there is no process for them to take a mugshot. Um, or to or to process him. Um, in addition, just just to clarify, um, we provide pictures of mugshots here in those cases where we have them to valid uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, but we don't actively circulate uh, pictures. The only thing that we do here is we we post the arrest blotter uh, daily on who is arrested in Blue Hill. Okay, and David um, Piffner. He has a mugshot. Is that an old mugshot, or is that something that was taken with in Bloomfield Police Department uh, recently? It, again, we operated under those same guidelines. Um, he was a, he was charged with two misdemeanor charges. He was given a, a, a promise to appear in court, and that was based on a warrant uh, uh, issued by the court. His, his arrest. Uh, he was issued that court date and a uh, a summons to appear in court with a one thousand dollar non surety bond. Okay, thank you. And then just one last point in regards to, I know I brought this up in public safety as far as wanting to ban the chokehold. And I'm um, very encouraged to hear that in it is updated within the policy, but the policy can change. So I would ask for council to, again, consider um, a resolution in the future to make that a permanent gesture for the town. But let, let, let me just clarify too. We Putting it in the policy, I think is, 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 we're going to follow that standard, and I think that that is entirely appropriate. We have we don't advocate that. We don't train our officers in that. So it's similar to we we don't train officers to run people over with cars. But we don't have a strict prohibition against running people over with cars. You just you can't do it, you know. And in in Bloomfield, you can't do chokeholds. Officers are taught that in the police academy. They're taught that at the police department here. And they're trained that that is not an acceptable use of force. Mm -hmm. But using it to my point is there's no consequence if they do breach that policy. And I'm not sure we're, we're leaving it up to the police department to implement the discipline on breaking policy. So I think that putting in another third party into the mix of that discipline process would be healthy. But thank you. Thank you for the comment. I, I just like to add when, when you talked about de-escalation de uh, training, we have identified um, uh, some training available, the LEADS training, law enforcement active de-escalation training. Great. You can you can look it up online. Um, it's a very um, comprehensive de-escalation training. Uh, we are going to have to identify a source for that um, because the, as you know, the uh, discretionary training budget for 2020 was eliminated from the police department in the budget cuts. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, council on that. Uh, Damon has a uh, question. Good evening. Every accreditation process always lists areas of improvement. What are the areas of improvement that have been recommended to the Bloomfield Police Department by CLIA? The two primary areas of recommendations of improvement were our communication system, which we engaged in, um, and that should be updated at the end, of, well, at the middle of July, that should be fully up and running. Um, uh, the condition of the police department, in particular, the front lobby area, was considered as a hindrance to community policing. Um, you've heard me talk about that. Um, but as far as the operations or the policies that we have, um, there were no policy uh, recommendations made for improving the policies or the community policing 
uh, outreach uh, that we currently engage in. And I can provide a full copy of that uh, assessor's report to the council for your review. Um, Meredith says, your bias-based profiling 2019 report suggests that the recommendation is that the police department will take proactive measures. Do you believe an annual training is sufficient to ensure that your personnel are consistently trained in implicit bias, diversity, and inclusion? No, I would love to do more training. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a cost benefit uh, analysis. It's, you know, how much training can we, can we give to officers um, and still get them out in the field um, and get them out serving the community. Every time you take them off for training, you're, you're, you're taking them out of that service. So um, I would, I would welcome more time for training officers and bias based uh, policing uh, initiatives um, and prohibitions, I should say, for clarification. Um, and look forward to working with the council in identifying those, those advanced or progressive uh, training um, opportunities and, and applying those to the, to the officers in this department. There's certainly no resistance whatsoever to that. Glad to hear you say that because I'm sure we're going to find some means to make sure that um, implicit bias training is done um, on a more regular basis. Larry says, do we have an issue with PD and the black community? Yes or no? I get counsel with the no tolerance message. It would also be great if counsel could put the message out there that we are not a racist town. I'm going to lower counselor curtain. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Chief, for your comprehensive Thanks, um, report and the policies that you sent out. I had an opportunity to go through it, and I appreciate that. And I know we can continue this conversation as we go through the months ahead through the Public Safety Committee. But I, I do want to just highlight a couple of things. First, I just want to go back quickly to something that my colleague said, uh, Councilor Wong, in regards to the chokehold. Within the policy, it says that you don't recommend within uh, your department to use that. But if that police officer feel that they're in danger, they can they can enforce they can use that as a means to defend themselves. That's no, what I, I read. I don't I don't want to offer any confusion. It, they are strictly prohibited in a deadly force struggle. If an officer is struggling for his life, we Correct. don't have a prohibition against any use of force. That is gotcha. reasonable to overcome that re that, In that including resistance. including the choke hole. Yeah, if they if they could yeah. articulate um, that due to the circumstances and what was occurring that that was necessary to protect someone else from deadly force or themselves right. from deadly force, then that would that would be evaluated. It would not would it would not simply be um, you know condoned as yes that's okay. We would do a thorough review of that case, a thorough investigation to determine whether that level of force was, was necessary, was reasonable, and was appropriate in that situation. So here's a question. And I, I, have for, yeah. and I would report on that to the council, town council public safety committee. Uh, so here's a question I have for you, chief. So if Washington was to legislate to ban the use of chokehold, would an officer still be able to use that if that was the means to, for him to defend himself in a dire situation? I don't know the answer to that question, okay. sir. I, okay. I, I would no, have no. to do more research on that. No, that's um, fine. That's fine. I just wanted to, to kind of get a sense, you know, if the law is passed that you can't use chokehold, can that officer still fall back and say, that was the only means for me to defend myself or someone else? So I just wanted to just touch on that. Yeah, it's just a question. You don't, if you yeah, don't have it, the answer it's, to it. it it's, I mean, it, it is prohibited. Um, it's prohibited by, by, uh, Connecticut post standards now, um, but I, I believe that every prohibition is going to have the caveat that if you're in a situation that you're trying to save someone's life or your own life, um, that it, those have to be evaluated based on the totality of the circumstances in an incident to see if that was a, a reasonable or necessary use of force. And, you know, I imagine in 99.9% in .9 of cases that that's 
that's not going to be so. But you're always going to have one case where you say there was no other alternative for the officer than to than to result to that. Um, okay. That, and and again, that would that would be transparent. I would report on that. Um, in, in a, a, we do full reviews of all use of force cases here at the police department. We report on those to the state, and I report on those to the public safety committee. So there would be no. You would know about it. I got you. All right, thank you. So I just want to now just address the uh, the case with Mr. Fannin that uh, allegedly pulled the gun on um, uh, a gentleman uh, a few a few weeks ago uh, yes, on, on on June on June seventh. Um, so here's yeah. Uh, so here's I think the the concern that residents and I know members of the council, including myself have with this case. I think when I went through and read the police report and the charges that were filed at the time, I think based on everything that was said, uh, Mr. Fannin obviously lied several times to the officers about- yeah, without a doubt. Exactly. And um, I guess where I'm confused based on the current felony, uh, class D felony that's currently um, uh, the two class D felony, to me, reading your initial report, the officer report, that should have been applied by that officer. And that's just my opinion. Uh, so where was the, the, the gap in what was filed on that report? Because I don't believe there's any other evidence that the state had to increase the, those charges. So I'm trying to, to get where the gap is locally. What happened from that standpoint when those officers um, encounter Mr. Fannin, everything that they wrote within that report. I mean, even Mr. Fannin even said that if he had to get out of the, the vehicle, he felt that he would have had to shoot the gentleman. And then he made- yeah, and, 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 and that statement was certainly one of the reasons that's the, that the state's attorney's office made the, the decision um, after a thorough review of the police officer's reports to increase the charges. Correct. So- the officers on scene um, applied the, the law enforcement officer's field manual and the, and the breakdown of the, the elements of the, of the crimes there uh, to determine what they felt uh, in their experience was the appropriate charge. Now, you have to balance that too against statements from the accused and the victim. And the victim made a statement to the investigating officer with the sergeant, with the supervisor present, that was exculpatory in nature. And that had to be, that, that weighed heavily on the supervisor in making the determination on what charge was initially to be filed. Yeah, and I think what you're, what you're referring to, I think the, the victim initially said that he didn't pull the weapon on him. I think there was a little the, the, there. The, the victim stated, and it's on it's on camera, it's on the officer's body camera, when he was yeah. asked directly by the investigating officer, did he point the gun at you? And I want to be careful because this, this case is, is being prosecuted. It's an active case, yep. We want to ensure a successful prosecution in this case. Correct. Um, so I only want to talk to the facts, and this is, this is on tape and will be revealed um, during trial. Um, the victim made a statement, what we in, in, in law enforcement and police work call a spontaneous utterance. When he was initially asked the question by the investigating officer, did the, did the, the, the suspect point the gun at you? He responded, no, 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 he, he didn't point the gun at me, he didn't. He later gave a statement to the assisting officer, Officer Farah, stating that you know he raised it up and he pointed it in his direction. So the office, the sergeant who was on scene he struggled with that. He was, how do we interpret it? Is it a threatening charge or, or do we have to lower it? And he felt that based on what they had and the exculpatory information that they had, that he had to go with disorderly conduct. Now, as I said in my statement, he followed up the next morning by calling the state's attorney's office and saying, listen, this is what we have because this was a Sunday evening. So you're, you're dealing with who's available at the time, right? So it was the supervisor who called the shift lieutenant to make the to, to decide on the appropriate charges. On Monday morning, he called the state's attorney's office, got an inspector, a representative who reviewed the case with him and said, no, I think you made the proper call. But given the 
the charging parameters and our policies here at court in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the, 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 the summons to appear in court would have been the same, regardless of the charge. The prosecutors are gonna look at it and we'll take that into account and that can be increased at a later time. And we're very open with that from the get-go. Now, I will tell you, I had, I had personal meetings with the state's attorney's office on that on that case to say, I need you to take a personal interest and a personal review of this case because there is a lot of there is a lot of concern in my community about whether or not these were the appropriate charges. And the relevant time to increase those charges from the state's attorney's perspective is at that that date of appearance, that court date. And attorney Needleman could certainly speak to that more than I can. I, I'm not a lawyer. Um, and I don't know all the, the processes at Superior Court, but that's the time that you work off the, uh, the preliminary charges that are filed in the field and the prosecutor can review the case and increase those charges or that they can, they can and many times it happens that they de decrease them or throw them out entirely on the, on the court appearance. Yeah, and Chief, uh, the second, the second the statute as the 53A-181K Intimidate, sure providing that feedback. Yeah, intimidate due to bias, second degree. Uh, when I, and that's the state uh, filing, when I go to the report, based on a lot of the comments that Mr. Fannin made at the time that was in the police report, uh, he also stated that, uh, you know, officer, when, when they are walking with their hands in their pockets, uh, and he also stated that he felt he was bigger than him and, and so on. So I could see how the state attorney um, office uh, could file that because to me, based on those comments, I'm not gonna say, but you can tell you know, his mindset at that time in how mm -hmm. he basically described uh, this mm -hmm. young man. Yes. Yeah, and that was the concern of the officers at the scene. And I think I spoke to that at the press conference a few days later. Um, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that that race was involved in this, um, and that's 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 an understatement. Again, I go back to when they reviewed the elements of the crime of intimidation based on bigotry and bias. The supervisor didn't feel that it 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 reached that threshold. And I can supply that that statute to you all so that you can read it and review it. Okay. Um, but he, in reading it, he said, I, "I just didn't feel that I had it." So I followed up with I followed up with a racial bias crime report to the court um, to ensure that they knew the severity of this and that we believed that race was an issue here, based on the the suspect's statements to the officer. Uh, in particular, you know, the, the statement that he said if he got out of the car that he would have used deadly force. Um, and, and some of the other statements that, that contributed to the supervisor's um, rationale in seizing the weapons and seizing his permit, and then making a further application to, to continue that seizure and then apply to the State Board of, of Special Licensing and Firearm to revoke his permit, permit based on those considerations. Okay, and this is my last uh, question, Chief. Mr. Fannin did attend a lot of those um, block watch uh, meetings per se at the Bloomfield um, PD's office, right? Is yes, I don't know how many attended, but okay. he he was in attendance at the block watch meetings. Okay. Or he was in he was in attendance at some block. block so watch he's meetings. he's there. I think some officers are familiar with him per se. I mean, he is that a fair statement, Chief? I, I I don't know the I don't know the honest answer to that question. I would oh. say that they they are. I know Officer Wilkins uh, was familiar with him when I asked him. So yes, and Officer Wilkins is the is the primary port of, point of contact for the block watch. But again, we we are not affiliated with any any neighborhood watch group or any any type of neighborhood patrols by citizens. Um, that block watch is 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 to provide information to the community, to listen to uh, community members and resident, residents and business owners' concerns, and to work on like long-term problem solving for particular neighborhoods. You know, whether it might be 
you know, recently we're getting a lot of complaints about fireworks. So that'll be something we'll address in the block watch meeting. You know, if you see locations that that they're that they're firing off the fireworks, let us know so that we can put them into our computer aided dispatch system to alert us to where the primary locations are to respond. Things like that. Yeah. And I just want to say, Chief, this is not a reflection of the work that you've done over the, the nine years being here in the town of Bloomfield, but I think it's important for us to focus on incidents like this when it happened and try to resolve it in a very open way, especially with the climate that we're facing within, within the country. So I appreciate your, your candor and the work that you have done with this. And hopefully we can continue the, the dialogue in, in future months to, to come. Thank you. I completely agree. And, 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 and you know, it's, I'd like to emphasize as well that not in this case that happened on a Sunday night. That was a case re that was a complaint received into our dispatch center um, from both parties involved. Um, but uh, the case at Silestine uh, Pond um, was Miss Duncan had written a, a, an email to myself and to a number of news outlets. And I'm not sure if she copied the mayor and the council on that. Um, but as soon as I got that, which was the following morning, um, we initiated an immediate investigation. I recognized the severity of, of that incident um, and the complaint and, and moved on that very quickly um, to make sure that we investigated that and, and took action as quickly as we could. So um, I'm gonna just read a couple. Uh, Larry, uh, yes, Bloomfield is a good and safe place to live, but I do believe that every good and safe place has room for improvement. And I believe that every good and safe place when issues arise, the best thing for us to do is to address it swiftly. And I believe that that's what we're doing. Greg has a two part question. What is the racial composition of the police officers in town? And with respect to recruiting police officers, what efforts are being made to recruit and retain residents of Bloomfield and recruits of color? Chief. So the, the breakdown in the police department, we're authorized for 48 sworn officers in the Bloomfield Police Department. We currently have 47 on staff right now. Um, 13 constitute minorities or 27% of our force and 13 are females uh, or 27%. Or uh, if we break down that further, we have uh, eight African-American officers. Sorry for the light here eight African-American officers and five Hispanic police officers. Um, I do a comprehensive uh, recruitment and retention report uh, to the town manager every year as part of our, part of our, I keep going back to it, but our CALEA process where um, I report on the efforts that the police department and human resources make to recruit a very diverse workforce here in Bloomfield. Um, human resources is the primary um, department that is responsible for that. Um, the police department gets involved after the testing um, and we do the background investigation. And then I interview every um, successful uh, candidate who makes it through that background for, uh, for a position here at the police department. We have, we have made uh, significant efforts towards recruiting a diverse workforce in Bloomfield. We have met uh, and exceeded all of our affirmative action goals that were established or, or set for us by human resources and by the previous councils. But we have a, we have a long way to go. I recognize that and I, I report on that um, every time that I'm asked that question, you know, that uh, the number of minority applicants that we get to the police department is not high. It, it's, unfortunately, it's not high. And Every police department in the region that I'm aware of is struggling with the same issue to try and diversify their department. Um, and, and our applicant pool is small. We used to give a, a test for police officer in Bloomfield and we would get five to six, 700 applicants. I think the last test we got less than 100 applicants. Um, and and our, our pool of of candidates after the written test and the oral panel was very small. Um, under, under town manager uh, Phil Schenk and the previous council, we implemented that every interview panel uh, had to reflect the demographic breakdown of the community, it had to be a majority uh, African-American uh, panelists uh, on that panel. Um, and then 
uh, we further went in our review process that uh, if there's any question um, that someone is not getting a fair shake uh, or a fair look during the background process here at the police department, I send it off to an independent um, review panel, which consists of uh, members of uh, town departments and one member from the police department to review that background and, and see if they should be granted further consideration. So I think that we're doing a good job of recruiting. Um, it, again, HR can tell you all the organizations, um, minority-based organizations um, and affiliates that they, that they send out the recruitment brochures to and actively go to um, uh, recruitment fairs for. Um, but we can always improve. We can always improve to try and I'm, I'm open to any way that we can get a more diverse field of applicants uh, that we can introduce to this police department. Um, yeah. So I'm going to um, put two uh, comments, questions together, Anthony and Joan. Um, Anthony says, there are requests nationally to move from reasonable to absolute necessity reasonable to absolutely necessary. How are these requirements different? And then Joan says, I hear the chief using the words reasonable and necessary interchangeably. However, these seems to me to be different standards. For example, CA Senator Kamala Harris advocates for replacing the standard of reasonable with a standard of necessary. Please comment. Sure, I, I, I hope I wasn't using those terms uh, interchangeably and you can see them, I'm, I'm not making them up, I'm taking them directly from our use of force policy. Again, that policy is on our webpage under the, on the left-hand column under general orders. Uh, I supplied it to every member of council. Um, officers are, are, are authorized to use um, a reasonable amount of force to overcome resistance. And that force has to be necessary to overcome that. There, there are two different definitions, um, and I certainly hope I wasn't using them interchangeably. Um, I'm not sure of what uh, Senator Harris has introduced at the national level. Um, again, our policy was developed in accordance with federal and state statutes. Uh, best practices that were, that were provided to us by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement and on our on our subject matter expert um, that we that we review the policy with, um, I'm confident that it is a it is a progressive policy, um, and that it safeguards the rights of members of our community, um, residents and business owners or visitors to our community. But I would certainly uh, welcome engaging members of the community um, or or other experts in modifications to that policy uh, to ensure that we are we are further safeguarding um, the rights of our community members, it, certainly. So Mary says, towards building trust in the past 12 months, how many police officers had a disciplinary action instituted? How long does it stay on their record? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, we report on that every year. Um, I'd have to I'd have to come back to the council with that answer. It's in the last year, I would say it's probably a half a dozen. Um, the record is a permanent record, uh, as long as they're an employee with the department. We operate on a on a, a misconduct policy here that is progressive in nature. In other, way, in other words, if you do something the first time and let's say you get a written warning, um, you don't go back to a written warning the next time. It's escalated up. Uh, to a, a one-day suspension or a three-day suspension. Um, each violation is also classified. So um, theft from the department is not on the same scale as forgetting to write your police report or showing up late for work. If you steal something, you're going to be terminated from the department. If you're late to work, you might get a, a, a admonition the first time. Second time, you might get a written warning. Um, but certainly, if you have, if you have incidents um, of discipline that have significant consequence, say a three-day suspension or a five-day suspension for something, which is very, very rare. Um, the next course that would be would be termination would be on the table. You, you, you don't give multiple bites at the apple, right? You either have a mistake of the heart or a mistake of the head, and, and you need to evaluate those things. And if I, 
if I believe that an employee is, is not um, serving the best interests of the community um, and the department, I have no hesitation then to remove them from this department and this community, none whatsoever. And I have demonstrated that over the past nine years. We have, we have had a number of separations here, whether it's due to an inability to perform the job um, or disciplinary reasons. Um, and, and that's difficult on the department in the town because I've reported to this at council several times, you've heard me say it. it the recruitment to the, the, the getting an officer on the street as a police officer takes about a year. Um, so you don't wanna just eliminate somebody, you know, willy nilly for lack of a better term. Um, you wanna make sure that, that you've done your due diligence, that you've investigated the matter and that you're taking the appropriate action in a situation. And you have to balance that against employee rights, uh, their collective bargaining rights and their rights under, under state statute. So it's, it's a very complex uh, balance um, that we try to manage as, as best we can. Um, in addition, I'll just add uh, quickly that I have the ability at the police department um, that I negotiated in the last collective bargaining agreement to issue discipline up to a five-day suspension. Anything over a five-day suspension, the employee um, gets a hearing with the town manager uh, where I present the evidence and the town manager makes the ultimate decision on that. Um, based on, on my discipline or the town manager's discipline, the employee by state law and by our collective bargaining agreement then has the opportunity to engage in the grievance process to go to the state board of mediation, labor and mediation, or mediation and arbitration rather at the labor board to determine if that, if that um, discipline was fair and reasonable under, under state guidelines and state law and our collective bargaining agreement. So I hate to give a long-winded answer, but it's, it's a very complex process and it's a, a policy, our misconduct policy is one that we developed uh, over long del deliberations with our legal expert uh, on, on what we could and couldn't do and our labor attorney here in town. Um, Meredith asks, how many people of color are executive leadership within the police department? We have uh, one supervisor who is African-American and one supervisor who is um, Hispanic. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Chief, uh, for your answers to these questions and participating in this, uh, in this discussion. Uh, I appreciate your leadership on these issues. I had one couple of questions. Yes, sir. Uh, one is with respect to the use of body cameras. And I know that our town is one of 23 in the state that had gotten involved and has everybody, all our policemen with uh, police, police personnel with body cameras. My, cons my question is this, as I see events happening around the country uh, where officers inter interdict a, a suspect or whatever and, and it goes wrong, and they say, well, we didn't have our cameras on. And, and reading through the, uh, your, your guidelines and so forth, I didn't come across anything that uh, specifically spoke to the use of cameras and when they must be used and what the penalties might be. I may have missed it, but that's a question. I, 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 what, 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 how would you respond to that? Certainly, um, the, the body camera, uh, body worn camera policy is separate from the use of force policy. I can provide that to council. Uh, I can publish, publish it on the webpage if you'd like, if you think that that's relevant material. Um, Bloomfield was the first town in Connecticut to take advantage of the state's uh, Governor Malloy's guideline, law enforcement uh, policing guidelines and apply for um, the credit for for body-worn cameras in town. Um, we have a very comprehensive body-worn camera policy. Every member of the department, including myself, when you're out on the field is required to wear a body-worn camera um, and you are, are required to record every interaction with a member of the public. Um, some of those are protected by HIPAA guidelines, privacy guidelines, et cetera. Um, 
if an officer or an employee does not have their camera on them or does not engage it, um, we would first look to see if there was some type of a technical malfunction. Um, and if it wasn't, then the officer would be taken up on disciplinary charges. It's unacceptable. Um, what we tend to find um, is that we have multiple angles of, of camera footage in many of these instances because you'll have you'll often have two, three, or four, depending on the complexity of an incident, uh, camera angles that is a plot uh, um, available to you. So you have to go through a lot of material, um, but uh, it, it's a very comprehensive program. It's a very it's a very expensive program, unfortunately. Uh, it's not cheap, um, but I think it's it's done a lot to, um, to, to give the community confidence and to, to protect the employees at the same time. Um, and what I've said to the Public Safety Committee in the past is that often um, someone will make an initial complaint to the police department about an incident, and it's often a misunderstanding. We'll have them come in and we'll review the body camera footage with them um, as part of that complaint process uh, to show them exactly what was captured on there and work through that. So. Okay, well, I think it would be um, helpful if you submit that to us so we can see what it looks like, the, the guidelines. Well, you had six or seven pages of guidelines. I can't imagine how many guidelines you have to have to operate a, a police force. That's uh, extreme. And then, there's other, and then there's other guidelines and something else. But I appreciate that. And uh, I wanted to ask you also about uh, the status of our, what you call the, the Police Awareness Academy. What What is that? And is it... And is it functional? Is it is it in any way a, a review board? What, what is its purpose? No, so the Citizens Police Awareness Academy is a, is a 12 week program. Uh, it typically meets on Tuesday evenings from seven, scheduled seven to nine. It often goes seven to ten, um, where members of the public can come in, learn about the police department, learn about what we do, what it takes to become a police officer in Bloomfield. Uh, the dis different aspects of policing from animal control, which has certainly been a hot topic uh, in the last six months, to homicide investigation, um, serious crime investigation, our community outreach efforts, uh, traffic investigation, things like that. It is, it is not a review board in any way. It's more of an educational piece um, and an opportunity for members of our department to interact with members of the public in a, in a way that explains what we do and and why we do it. So I often say to them at, at the introductory meeting, you know, I hear it from people all the time that I'm driving down the road and I see three cars pulled over and there are three police cars there with one car and there's three people. Why? And we try to explain to them what may be a, a taking place in that situation that you need three officers so, so that they have greater understanding of what they see and how it applies. So, so it's an informational function and to the extent possible, a recruiting function if you, if you get people who might be interested in, in, in applying to the, to the department. In that regard, another point, uh, at the meeting last week with the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, one young man got up and uh, was commenting on the fact that it's very difficult for uh, uh, minority uh, individuals to in get involved or be motivated to be participate in police operations or police force uh, because uh, they're the because of the culture I'm not saying here in Bloomfield necessarily but they're met with uh, an unwelcoming uh, uh, series of almost like a like a fraternity uh, a rush requirement and you had to play the game it was not conducive is what he was saying maybe and, and I, maybe i shouldn't use the word fraternity because it's more serious than that but i'm just saying in terms of foolishness well, there's a, there's more foolishness than than trying to work together to, to to make the best of it and i think it was also made with comment that we did have a police cadet program which is you've mentioned i think at our at our public uh, uh, safety meetings uh, is not really panned out very well. We only have like one person now that might be uh, involved. So those two issues go together on how we increase our minority participation on the police force. And, and I, I'm not necessarily looking for an answer. 
I'm just posing it as something that we have to work on, irrespective of the guidelines that we talked about tonight, if we're going to move forward to see if whether or not uh, we need to uh, either find some of the financial methods to make that happen. But if, if we're going to uh, uh, expand our force of, with, with minority, you know, integrate our force with a better term, perhaps, uh, we have to come up with some, some real uh, efforts. And I think those are two areas that might be helpful. So uh, I think that's all I had. Um, that, that's about it. Thank you very much. I think the community um, policing program that we have is a very robust one. I did go through the program. I learned a lot. Um, I think as probably one of the first classes, maybe, <laughs> was really excited to learn um, about our entire police force and why things happen the way they happen. Um, appreciated the, the, the training on shooting a gun and all that goes into actually pulling the trigger. Um, so I, I, I applaud that program and I would encourage any of the counselors who have not gone through the program to the next time that they have the program to please sign up and go. I also want to just say that with these two incidents that took place, I know that the chief, as soon as he got the information, he got wind of one on Thursday night and he was right on it. Um, the next in incident that happened, he was right on it as well. So I can say that while our police department isn't perfect because there is no perfect police department, I can say that they're very responsive. And I can say that the officers that I know that they're very respectful. Um, so while we are talking about what could be better, right? I think we're also very appreciative of the police department that we do have here in town. I'm appreciative that the, the chief is taking time to have this discussion because it's a discussion that's needed. But I also remember a few years ago um, with the community awareness task force that we had these discussions and the chief was present for each and every one of the discussions. And sometimes they were very difficult conversations to have chief, having someone who wasn't the mayor yet, just the mother yelling and screaming um, about what she felt was going on in town and the chief sat there and he addressed. So the only thing that I can say is those conversations, shame on us that those conversations stopped. We should have pivoted with those conversations and continued those conversations to make sure that our police force is one, reflective of who we are here in town, and two, be that model police force for other towns and other states to look at. So I think once again, this conversation is good and Chief, I do thank you for that. I have been in contact with people from New Haven and people from Hartford who also have really good ideas to help us help our police department. And I know that you're very open to that. So these conversations will continue. So once again, thank you very much, um, Chief. I greatly appreciate it. I know that Councillor Wong has her hand up and I think Councillor Curtin has his hand up as well. But since they both spoke before, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Councillor Goff to unmute himself so that he can give his, his um, comment. Great. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, appreciate that. And I, I want to ask one sort of clarifying question that I'm a little, still a little confused about, but then I want to move on to um, what the mayor just referred to. And I think, you know, what, what's been a common theme here is that we may have a great, you know, we may have a very good department, but there's always room for improvement. And I, I want to get to a couple of things that have been in the papers and just ask uh, the chief's opinion on them. Uh, but the one thing I want to get a little clarification on is I'm, I'm still not completely clear about this block watch we have. Um, is, is the block watch townwide or is it focused on a specific community? Because I, I think what I heard was it's a it's sort of a townwide block watch, and it's really more of an it's called a block watch, but it's more of an information uh, uh, information. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think okay. we, we, we can't get caught up in the term block watch, okay. right? Because I think the term uh, lends the impression that this is citizens on patrol, you know, uh, walking around their neighborhoods. It, that's not the case. The block watch is more of an interchange of, of ideas, right? It's, it's the community service officer on the second Wednesday of every month meeting with a group of residents throughout town to talk about what's happening in Bloomfield, what the stats are, what we're seeing, any major incidents that have happened. Um, and then to most importantly, get input from them on what's happening in their particular neighborhoods, um, what concerns they're having, what they're seeing, 
and what we can apply resources to. You know, most of our interaction with members of the public is 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 acute, right? It's mm -hmm. it's you call because you have a certain complaint. We come out, we try to remedy that complaint. So the block watches is more of a, a an open dialogue to work on long term problems within particular neighborhoods or throughout the town. Um, in addition to that town wide meeting, the Blue Hills Ave group. Right. Um, Mr. Griggs and that group, you're all well aware, they have a very robust group on their own. And we've been down in the Persian Park neighborhood. They're very active. They're very, um, they advocate very strongly for their neighborhood, which is fantastic. Um, and we work directly with them as well on specific concerns that they have in that neighborhood and along the, the Blue Hills Ave corridor. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, I want to make sure it's not some type of neighborhood patrol or anything. So we have to we have to get away from that kind of block watch term. Right. Well, well, that's why that's why I was asking for clarification. Yes, and, no, and, and 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 I also did term because people and people kind of understand what the general the yeah. general consensus is there. We're we're out looking for um, improvement in the quality of life in our community and how can we best get there. So it's it's from our perspective, it's meant to be an interchange of ideas and learning about problems and then applying our resources and then at the following month, similar to how I do at the public safety meeting is reporting on those things that we've done to address some of the concerns that came up the previous month. Great. Yeah, that's why that's why I want to get a little clarification. So um, just moving ahead with a couple of things. I, I know I think everyone on the council and everyone, uh, you know, I'm sure most of the public attendees have been spending lots of time reading, um, you know, reading all of the stories around the nation and the state of Connecticut, et cetera, about uh, just the dialogue we're having on, on policing, what does it mean, how should it be done? Uh, and I know a lot of these things will come up uh, again shortly in the uh, Public Safety uh, Committee, but I just want to raise a couple of things tonight. Um, first of all, um, you know, one question that seems to come up a lot is, are there things the police shouldn't be doing anymore? Uh, one one uh, article I read in Connecticut in particular, uh, uh, one chief, I think, made the comment that we really shouldn't be stopping, you know, should are, are, is the police, the armed police as we have now, is that the best avenue to be stopping cars for light bulbs out? I mean, there's a safety issue there, but there's also a, a um, you know, overlapping issue with do situations like that, you know, are you are you in, entering situations that have some tendency to escalate? So that was one suggestion, and I would like your thoughts on that. Um, and then I have a couple of others. Yeah, I think that you'll see in that strategic operating plan that I offered you in my initial uh, plan back in 2012, I emphasized that motor vehicle stops is not, not something that I advocate for as a method of improving the quality of life in a community. Um, but in engaging in, sounds very cliche, but engaging in problem solving, listening to people, and how you can apply our resources from the police department on improving the quality of life in their neighborhoods. And, and every neighborhood may have subtly different things that they're worried about. Um, but that, that motor via, random motor vehicle stops, is, in my estimation, has never been shown to really improve the quality of life in a community. Certainly, if you have concerns from a community perspective or from data that you're getting, which I report on every month, like, mm -hmm. you know, certain streets in town that we get complaints, Brown Street, we always get, Maple Ave, um, Woodland uh, of speeding, excessive speed, Jackson Road of, we want, we want um, environmental impacts down there, like uh, speed bumps, et cetera, to impact that. You do enforcement in those areas. First, we, as We've always said, or I've always said, we put out the speed meter to get data to see if it's a perception issue or if there's actually some data to support that there is some speeding or all of other relevant things happening there that we can make an impact on. Um, and then we do enforcement in those areas to make that impact. Our enforcement almost exclusively consists of, of warnings at the beginning. 90% of times, I hate to say this, 90% of times we get a complaint from a na active neighborhood residents that they're speeding in their neighborhood. And when we stop people, they all live in the neighborhood. 
So the last thing you want to do is start giving them all tickets. You don't, you don't engender a lot of support for the police department by giving your residents tickets. Um, but you want to be able to make an impact there. So, you know, you take the opportunity, and this is what I've tried to instill in, in my staff, is you take an opportunity then to educate people. Listen, this is why we stopped you in this particular neighborhood, you know, and this is the concerns from the neighborhood about speeding or whatever it might be, and then, and then reporting back to the Public Safety Committee on whatever impact we've had. Um, now, you still have officers who have a who have a proclivity towards motor vehicle stops. You know, they got into this line of work because because they want to do stuff like that. And we have to address those things yeah. on an individual capacity. But our general philosophy and our general uh, marching orders, if you will, is we need to be engaged in building relationships with our community. And motor vehicle stops, in my estimation, is probably the most negative. Uh, interface that you have with a member of the community. I get pulled over from time to time, not in my town car. Um, and, and I get a, I get a chill up my spine when I get pulled over. I, I know what it feels like. And I've been a police officer for, I hate to say it, for 30 years, but I get that feeling. So I have some ability, definitely muted, but some ability to empathize with how, how people feel when they initially get stopped. And I, I certainly understand there's demographic ramifications to that as well. Um, but we don't advocate and we don't certainly push that as an enforcement mechanism in Bloomfield. It's it's not effective in my estimation. Thank you for that answer. Um, the other thing that we've been reading a lot about is that um, so many situations which seem to, you know, which can lead to bad outcomes, um, seem to be issues where you're not, you know, when you talk about police work, we talk about robbery, burglary, uh, murder, you know, everyone, everyone sort of reacts the same way to those. But a lot of the incidents we read about anymore, um, they involve issues of mental illness, they involve issues of incapacity, they involve issues of, you know, um, counseling may need to be involved. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the police department really handling things they shouldn't, um, that when they go on calls, there really should be people, I mean, as, as, and I think you alluded to training before, you'd like to do more training, you know, bias training, de-escalation training, you'd like to do more training, but ultimately, police officers can't train all the time, right. and especially if it turns out that in a lot of situations, uh, the police officer is expected to be a you know, to, to be fully trained in various levels of social work um, uh, that, may, that may have much better techniques of, of de-escalating a situation. How, how much does that impact you? And, and um, you know, what, what would be helpful to the department from that point of view? Because we're, we're reading a lot of commentary on that. That's a huge subject. It's, 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 and it's, I think it's a long-term discussion, um, you know, certainly under strained municipal budgets, um, and I hate to, you know, kind of draw a broad concept here, but um, in limited resources, you try and find the best application to address a lot of these things, right? The police department is out there 24-7. In, in Bloomfield, we are the 24-7 uh, on, on the job representatives from town. So. In addition to law enforcement, officers are asked to answer, be the primary responder to medical calls, to mental health issues, to domestic violence related issues that may not be um, best suited for a police officer to go to, but some type of a, a clinical psychologist or some type of a crisis intervention worker. Um, and officers, we are constantly giving our officers advanced training, but advanced training in so many areas that they're, they're, they're literally jacks of all trades, right? The, 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 old, the old adage. Um, but I think that, that that discussion is a very broad discussion on what the best answer to that is. Is it a, is it a smaller police force, but a broader um, medical force to address uh, medical calls? And, and um, you know, 24 seven coverage by some type of crisis intervention workers or a crisis intervention team that you can bring out. Um, having 
police officers respond to domestics when there is personal injury involved, but then being able to back away and allow um, some mental health workers or some, some psychologists or long-term problem solving uh, uh, apparatus or, or people to address that, I think are really good, really good measures. You know, we, we talk about it as simple as blight issues and complaints from the community that we've talked with the council in the past that I didn't think are, and I still don't think the best answer is to have a uniformed police officer going out and, and citing people for their grass being too long and things like that. From my perspective, it just further creates that that atmosphere of animosity between the community and the police department. You know, you're only out here giving me tickets. You always say you're out here to build relationships, but now you're slapping me with a fine. Right. I don't like doing that. I don't want to do that. You know, I want to be able to, to have the officers go out there and interact on a positive way, interact with youth in a positive way and not, um, and limit at least the amount of, of times that we have to interact negatively with people. And I know I know it, uh, that my staff wants to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm confident of that. No, I, I think that I think it is a matter of, of framing, and it's important that interactions be framed the proper way because that you know if they're framed inappropriately, if they're framed as if they're framed as antagonistic, uh, antistic, antagonistic, uh, factionalized disputes, then you're likely to get an antagonistic, factionalized answer to the thing. And I, well, and I will. It's, we, it's, yeah. And it's one of the things that really concerns me about the, this, this relatively new concept in my, in my uh, vocabulary of defunding the police, um, because I think people misunderstand that as we don't need any police at all. You, you will still need somebody to go out and stop someone from hurting someone or investigate when someone get, gets hurt or the technical knowledge of investigating a car accident and making sure that people are are okay and helping them. Um, but I think that the future of policing, I hope, has this multidisciplinary approach that you don't just have police officers, but that you have other workers engaged and embedded in the department. And I, I believe that in committing to that, you also, you continue to break down that, that you know, concept that people believe of a brotherhood or this close group of you know, I'll, I'll cover secrets for you. You, you want to mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you have transparency in an organization. We try to do that as best we can. But by including other disciplines in the police department, you further engage police officers in interacting with other people besides just police officers. And that is very healthy for yeah. them and for the community at large. It, 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 it helps to uh, deal with group thing. Let me just ask you one one more question and, and then uh, a lot of these things, as I said, will, I know we will be taking up in public safety over the next few months and, and this would be a continuing conversation. Um, the one thing in, in, reading, in reading the materials you sent, and, and I know you have been very uh, strong on community policing and, um, you know, I, I, I think I am too, <laughs> uh, but I, I guess one of the things that I would like to see a little more is maybe a better definition of what that is, because uh, I know there is a debate um, in this, you know, community policing is also related to the whole broken windows notion, I think. Although I think, I think that's where the debate is, because some people think it's been carried to extremes, other people don't think it's been applied correctly. So I guess I would just like to get your thoughts on, um, you know, could we put a little more clarity around that? I, I mean, I, I think I understand what you mean, uh, right. but I, I, I have also heard, I have heard some citizens in town make comments that um, the, you know, they, they believe the community police presence may be too big of a police presence. So, um, you know, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, my concept of community policing is what I've repeated over and over um, in my in my presentations to members of the community, in my strategic operating plan, um, and other documents that I put forward, which is, is communicating with the community, working on identifying problems with the community, problem solving, working on once you've identified what the problem is, applying the resources from whether it's the police department or town government, public works, 
um, license and inspections or zoning um, or bringing other um, relevant state or regional aspects to bear on a community problem. Um, you know, I, I said it earlier, the police department is often the first uh, government entity to respond to a situation and community policing is really, okay, how can I bring other organizations to bear on that problem to make a greater impact so that layman's terms, I don't have to come out and, and, and address this again. We solve it and we move on and we, and hopefully we, in, we improve the neighborhood based on that. Um, and my community, you know, I always say we have a community police officer here and that's a representative to meet with community members. But every member here from, from myself down to the newest officer hired should be a community police officer in some way. It should be meetings like tonight in an open discussion where I answer questions from the, from the public rather than saying, well, no, I'm gonna stay in my office. I'm not gonna answer anything. We're just gonna do enforcement in the community. That, that doesn't work. Um, and the mayor has pointed out to me recently, we're not perfect. Um, we, need to, we need to learn and we need to improve. Um, and, and I believe that we do that, we do that consistently, consistently. Sometimes it's smooth. Sometimes like the last few weeks, it's turbulent. Um, but I've been doing this for 30 years. I, I understand that. I accepted that challenge. I, I love what I do for a living. Um, and that's the concept of policing that I want to continue doing here, here in Bloomfield as long as I'm able to do that. So um, that's my philosophy. I can certainly you know, expand on that in the future if you'd like. Yeah, great. That, 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 thank you. And we will uh, obviously... Uh as I said, be continuing these conversations in public safety and, and at the future council meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you talk about the um, different disciplines uh, as a part of the police department. Once again, talking with some of my counterparts um, in different parts of the state, they do have counselors, right? So they do have someone that goes out with the police and it depends on what the, the call is that they handle it. That, um, and it, it helps to put the police in a different spot it's, 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 and it also makes sure that the the condition or the situation is being handled and it, we're not trying to just arrest people, but we're looking at right. people in their totality of the circumstance. So I'm, I'm so glad that you, um, you brought that up because I know that the council will have to find um, creative ways to get some things done, something like that, creative ways to get more training, more bias training done. We're gonna to have to find those creative ways because I think once we strengthen our police department, we strengthen our entire town. I like the idea of community policing because if I know you and you know me, you can probably de-escalate a situation a whole lot easier than if we didn't know each other. Um, I, so I think that part of community policing is really important. Getting back to, I'm dating myself, the officer friendly mentality, right? <laughs> that helps us to, to have that trust, to have that relationship. And it helps us to be able to move from a combative situation to a more, a more respectable situation. So I'm so glad um, that- And even, that, even, yeah. in those, even in those community conversations that we had a few years ago, um, I never went alone. I think the initial one at, at um, Bethel AME, I went alone. But after that, I always brought um, a number of officers with me because I think it's important for members of the community to hear from them. And, and most importantly, for them to hear from members of the community and, and equate a face with a concern um, and build those relationships constantly. And you're always doing that. We're always doing that. And, and you know, I say it, you're there at every ceremony where I promote somebody. We've hired a lot of people here in, in the last eight years. We've had almost a full turnover of this department. So we're constantly bringing on new faces. And, you know, I hear from even, even members of the you know, employees at, 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 for the town of Bloomfield. They're like, I used to know everybody at the police department and now I feel like I don't know anybody. Um, and it's because we've had a lot of attrition and a lot of turnover. Um, and we need to consistently work on building those, those connections. And, and the, the conversations that we're getting ready to have will, will help to do that. I know that there will be one with clergy. I'll, <laughs> I'll give you that information pretty soon. <laughs> So that you'll so that you'll be in the loop, um, uh, counselor. You muted yourself, madam. Counselor, <laughs> oh. counselor Wong and counselor Curtin, I do see your hand. So I'm
I'm gonna let Councillor Wong go and then I'm gonna let Councillor Curtin go. Okay, thank you. Um, Chief, how many supervisors do we have? Just a clarifying question there. Um, when you say supervisor, do you, so a supervisor at the police department would be, would be sergeant, which is like a first line supervisor. Then you have a manager, which is a lieutenant. And then we have one operations captain and myself. So there are, I think there's nine sergeants at the department, three lieutenants, one captain, one chief. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm really glad that Councillor Goff brought up the social services, human services point of um, police accountability, uh, at least that's what I call it. And I know, Chief, you brought up defunding, and I know that language scares a lot of people, um, but I think it's more, again, reallocation of certain resources to direct them um, thoughtfully to a specific purpose, like social services, human services. And maybe we talk about... Um, on a council level doing a pilot program uh, where we do conflict resolution and mediation, such as a diversionary program where we do everything we can to divert this from diverting instances from going to the courts. So maybe Bloomfield yeah, we, can we, to, um, we do, do have that. We do that for our, for our youth, the juvenile review board. Um, that's the first uh, place that we go. Um, you always have to leave leave the court system there as as the you know the stick and the carrot so to speak that if they don't comply with the juvenile review board um mandates then they end up going to court but that's been a very beneficial program right and i'll go further by even recruiting msws a part of the police force um and gearing them up um, with some tools uh, because we do need people to respond to mental health and domestic issues and, and things like that. And again, the medical um, issues as well. So I'm glad that um, that conversation is on the table and we can continue them in smaller sub council meetings. I do have a question for um, uh, attorney Mark Needleman. I'm hoping he's still on, I see him on. And I wanted to understand more and I wanted the public to understand more in regards to who protects the police, who pays for the claims, how does that process work? Is it tax money? Do we have a defense lord? Is there a specific fund directed or um, allocated to um, in, in the instances where we do have claims against police and complaints? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. I switched devices. Okay, so the short answer is that the town has, for as long as I have been around, had ample liability insurance both for police related issues and just general liability purposes. So if a claim is brought against a policeman alleging official misconduct in the performance of duties, uh, that claim is forwarded to our insurance carrier who, if they can address it and resolve it, they do. If the matter isn't resolved at that level, then it's referred and it goes into litigation, which is unusual, but it happens, then the matter is assigned by our insurance counsel to defense counsel. And these are attorneys who are very well-versed in handling these kinds of matters. And as you know, from your few years on the council and others know from longer service, um, we have been extremely successful in defending uh, claims against the police department. And primarily, it's not because we have the best lawyers, although I think we have pretty good lawyers. It's because when the facts finally get placed on the table and the parties can objectively view what did and perhaps more importantly, what didn't happen, um, matters get resolved uh, in short course and often in our favor. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Curtin. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a couple of questions for the chief. Chief, I attended the, the high school graduation, I think it was a week or so ago, and an incident happened that really shocked me, and you can probably clarify it for me tonight. So at the end of the graduation, um, there was some a little brawl that took place. And um, I saw roughly around, I would say, I would say 10 or 20 cop cars showed up, right? And all these cops got out and 
the first thing I felt that I was disappointed is that, you know, officers were trying to get folks to move back. I mean, they could have been loud to get back, but they were using profanity to, to do their job, which in, I'm totally against. Uh, mm -hmm. These are residents and you have to treat them with respect. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really caught me off guard when I did my further you know, inquiry about those officers because I couldn't identify a single, well, there were a couple officers that I knew there, but the rest just looked totally different, strange. And my findings were, those were Windsor officers. They were. So I'm trying to get to the point where, where's the collaboration? Because this is the first time that I encountered that, except for any encounter and seeing Windsor officers and Bloomfield officers on the, the, the borderline, they work together in tandem from that standpoint. But I did not expect to see Windsor officers in the center of town in Bloomfield on a matter that I didn't believe needed that escalation. But once again, that's my judgment as a, as a resident, someone in the town. But those officers, number one, I felt that they did not know the folks who they came into the town and the way they treated those folks, I thought was in a very demeanor way. And that's where I think we're having the discussion nationwide. You talk about the, the escalation, those officers, how they came in hot, weren't trying to de-escalate de that situation. If you had some agitators within there, I could have seen that kind of escalate to something else that it shouldn't have been. So my first question, please elaborate a little bit on that collaboration that we have with Windsor. And uh, what is your thought on my comments in regards to the profanity that we're using to try to get the crowd back? So uh, a few things, you threw quite a few questions at me. I'll try and answer as, them as accurate as I can. If I miss one, please. I will, yeah, sure. I, I know you won't be bashful in calling me out on it. So. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, the incident that happened, uh, at, it was right at almost at the end of graduation yeah. where yeah. five students left to go. We yeah. had a fight um, between a graduate um, and a, a, a female graduate and another group of, of ladies there um, in which one, one, we believe two now, individuals wielded a, a, a chemical agent, a mace or pepper spray and sprayed a number of people. Um, the officers who were responding in, one of them called what they called an officer assistance, a 10-0 request, um, which marshaled all of our staff here at the police department to respond there due to the, due to the situation, the officer who called it initially. Dispatch then calls for uh, mutual aid under what is called the blue plan, which is a, a system in place throughout Connecticut um, where surrounding towns will respond into their neighboring town at our request um, to aid us in controlling a situation. Um, so that's where we respond. We'll, we'll often respond to um, Windsor or uh, Avon or Hartford um, when we're given a call for mutual aid as well. Um, I reviewed all those body camera tapes. Uh, that incident is still under investigation. We're moving forward with that. Um, and I believe that arrests will be made by affidavit within the next five to 10 days um, after we interview everyone involved. Um, I did see one of our staff use profanity um, and he has been spoken to by his supervisor um, in the context of that situation. And I'd be happy to talk about it further. Um, but it was something that I called out. The supervisor recognized it immediately as well. I, that's the only instance that I saw on body camera of profanity being used. I did see a number of officers uh, ordering people back um, in, in an effort to control the situation. Um, but as you said, the, the, those situations with multiple people there, with you know one of the one of the um, individuals involved as we were escorting uh, a young lady back to the to the police vehicle. Um, the mayor was a, a direct witness there. Um, one of the other ladies involved came running around and tried to re-engage uh, and she had to be um, physically detained. Um, and we had to work with her and a family member to make sure we got her under control and, and offered her medical assistance. So it, it was 
it was a very dynamic um, and fluid situation, for lack of better terms. And any time that you're trying to control a situation like that and you have to use force to do it, it never looks good. Um, we just have to evaluate it um, that the force was reasonable, as we talked about, and was necessary to control it. And then once any resistance or the situation um, calmed, that that force or that those commands are immediately drawn back. Um, and we try to do that as best we can. And we're doing, we will do a full after action uh, investigation of that and um, make recommendations and implement anything from training of our staff to discipline of officers who are found to have acted inappropriately. Uh, so thank you for explaining the blue plan to me because yeah, that was something that I was a little- Yeah, and that's a very maybe, brief explanation. Yeah. It's basically, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a mutual aid plan that you get a number of officers from surrounding towns when you request them immediately. So Chief, here's my last question. And you know, you don't have to comment on it, but I know, and this is probably a question for the council as a whole and probably the community. I know there's conversations about, you know, we definitely, I truly do believe that if we have a certain percentage of our police force living in the town, that relationship and that officer knowing, you know, folks within the community, it kind of enhances and helps the relationship with how you communicate. And I believe in long term, it has a lot of value. Uh, I know for the charter right now, the town manager is the only um, person that's required to live within the town. Would you support uh, the police chief uh, living in the town of Bloomfield? I think that's a great start because that sends the message. And if the police chief, I'm not saying you need to move tomorrow, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I think from, from a practical standpoint, I believe that if the chief lives in the town, that goes a long way. It sends a message to those officers. I live in this town. I know the neighbors. And I believe that's a really good start to change, you know, the type of mindset and how we police and the relationship building. So that's something definitely that I would bring toward the council to think about uh, in, in future months or years to consider. Uh, and I would also say the public works director, those key positions, I believe, is critical to living in the town. It's, it's that ownership, that buy-in. You live here, you, you have a different, in my opinion, I'm not saying that you don't really care about the town, but it's, it sends a message to the residents, the community as a whole. So that's, that's just my comment. I, I understand that. And, and, and we certainly encourage our, our, our employees here um, and advocate for them to, to live in Bloomfield or move to Bloomfield. There is a and Attorney Needleman can probably speak to it a little bit more than I can. There, I believe there's statutory language uh, on the on, in Connecticut general statutes that you can't require a residency um, for employees. Um, but I certainly understand the, the the concern about that and the advocacy for that. And I understand your position on that fully. But what what about the chief? You do you support that? You did answer it, that it, question. It was, it, listen, in, in in open conversation, it, it was not a requirement when I was hired. Um, I I do own property outside of Bloomfield in a town continuous to uh, to town, um, and, and you know I've considered it, uh, but there were other factors that that came into to play when I chose to where where I live. No, but would you support it? I'm talking general. Would you? No, I'm just trying to. I'm just not talking just Bloomfield. I'm talking across the country. I believe that's. No, I, I, I think there, 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 certainly there are communities that there, 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 there are there are advantages and there are disadvantages, right? There, the advantage to having myself or police officers live in Bloomfield, I can see that clearly. You know that you'd be able to see your neighborhood police officer. You'd be able to see me in the grocery store um, on the weekends and be able to talk to me about your concerns and things like that. You know, one of the major disadvantages is that from the employee's perspective, you, you never have time off, right? Because you're always you're always being asked about aspects of the job, and you're always being being you know you're always you always feel like you're working, and it's tough to relax. In particular, from a from a a law enforcement perspective, you know, and and um, so, so, you know, I mean, it's a it's a very broad topic to examine. Um, you know, 
I love Bloomfield. I love working in Bloomfield. I love being the police chief in Bloomfield. Um, and, and I hope that my, my service is, it has not been impacted by the fact that I live a town away um, and that I, that I give the same level of commitment to the community and the council and the residents um, that I would be if I was a next door neighbor. So chief, it's like, it's like the council. We, we work in the town, we live in the town. We don't get paid for, to do this, but we're always working. <laughs> Thank you. I understand, I understand. I, know. I don't live in town, but the, the mayor calls me quite a bit to let me know <laughs> what's going on in town. I knew that's exactly what you were going to say. If I lived here, she would always be at my house. <laughs> it's okay, Chief. Um, Anthony wanted to make sure that he says, I'm very proud of our community. Now it is time to lead the nation on redefining what policing looks like. Thank you. Mark says, I haven't spent much time getting to know our police chief, and I'm, I am and, and I am now happy to know and see firsthand how much thought and sincere effort Chief Hammock puts into his position. Thank you. He puts a lot of thought into it, especially when I um, reach out to him on the weekends. And that's not micromanaging, that's just informing him what's going on in our town. Right, Chief? Um, <laughs> Uh, Ms. Graham Day says, when other town police departments are called in to assist Bloomfield police, are the other town police departments operating under the same procedures and policies as Bloomfield police? Trained the same, have the same or similar commitment to community policing, et cetera? Uh, big question. Um, uh, broadly, they operate under many of the same or similar policies. Um, you know, the surrounding towns in the area, I know Windsor, um, I have a lot of confidence in, in their, officer, their officers. I came from Hartford, that's where I served 21 years of my career. Um, so I have a lot of confidence in the employees that come from there and, and a lot of the, 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 the policies and community policing aspects they have there. Um, but certainly it comes down to the atmosphere in a department. You know, and from the top down, are you are you engaged in improving the quality of life for for people who, I apologize about this light, um, who live in your town? Um, and I, I still firmly believe, and I know this sounds very cliche, and people shake their heads, but you know, I got into this line of work uh, for the right reasons. Um, my father, who was in this line of work, had a had a discussion with me my first year on the job, where I I did a few things that he didn't agree with. Um, and he said, you know, listen, people depend on you, right? They depend on you to do, to act when they won't. They depend on you to help them when they need help. And, and I believe that the people that I've hired here um, are genuinely in this line of work to do that. And the minute that I believe that they're not, uh, I try to uh, diplomatically show them the door um, and that there's not a place for them here. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. They have to go in other means, but um, you know I understand, fully understand the level of commitment and trust uh, that the that the community has in the police department, and I think that the last two weeks only demonstrates that that trust can be very strong, but it can also be very fragile, right? And it only takes one thing uh, to to interrupt that trust, um, and if you are not completely open. Um, and responsive uh, to people, then that trust can erode. And, and I certainly understand that. And I would, I would, I would agree with it 100%. So I hope I answered that question as best I could. Well, I know I did it as best I could. I hope I did it well. Um, of course, I've been talking for two hours straight. So I know. Um, so we're, we're going to close in a little bit. I just have two more. Um, John says, when someone calls the police on someone else for a bad reason, i.e. thinking they look suspicious, what follow-up with the person who called the police should be done to dissuade them from doing it again? If racism is a factor, what action can be taken? So certainly, if we find out that it's, if it's motivated by 
uh, nefarious means, whether that's a bias, a racial bias, or an ethnic bias, um, I would expect that the officers would follow up on that and you know to to educate that person. I think that if you if you look at the videotape of the incident um, uh, that we previously discussed from Ryefield Hollow North, a lot of the questions uh, that Councilman Curtin asked, uh, in particular, a lot of the questions that the sergeant was asking through that was to kind of ferret out what was the nature of why you called, you know. And, and in the process of doing that, um, it enabled some of those additional charges to be added based on his responses, right? Um, he, had, he had called only a week before on the same individual. We responded out, but the officer, when I, ended, when I asked him, I said, what happened? He said, nothing. I went there, the kid was just sitting in his car. I said, okay, thanks, have a good day. Should we have followed up and, and perhaps intervened with the person who called? Yeah, I think we have to work on that. You know, I think I think we have some we have some work to do to ensure that if we if we recognize that things um, that those complaints might be motivated by by race or by ethnic discrimination or ethnic or, or, or motives, um, then we need to do a better job of of stepping in. You know, we see those incidents across the nation. With you know pick them, they, they pop up on the nightly news all the time on somebody who calls and then threatens to call the police as a weapon to use against someone because of their the color of their skin or, or their ethnic origin. And that is completely and totally unacceptable. And in the end, you know who gets the, 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 the bad rap for it? We do, I, you know, I mean, my people do, my, my, my police officers, I mean, and that's, that's, una that, that, that's unacceptable. You know, it, it's, it does, it, you can make, I, I talked about this last week with the, with the faith leaders in town, you can make all these strides in the right direction and then something happens and boom, you're right down to, to building block number one, it seems like. And it's, it can be very discouraging as you say, geez, we're, we're trying to do everything right. One stupid act happens by somebody who's not thinking and you're right back to building block number one, if you're not even back to zero. So um, I think that these continued conversations, um, even though you, you know, that sometimes you feel like you're talking about the same thing a lot, are good to, to move us forward and move in the right direction. And, and frankly, I think just like tonight, a lot of good ideas come out of them um, that we can, we can all collectively work on. How do we improve the community, improve the police department, um, and, and move forward in setting, like someone else just recently said, setting an example of, of what, of, of the best way of doing things. Um, Councilor Goff, did you have something to say? Yes, that, thank you, Madam Mayor. I had, I had one, uh, I was looking at my notes uh, as, as we were listening to this, and I, I did have one other question I did want to ask the chief, it's sort of along the lines of community policing, but uh, just sort of the means. Um, the uh, forum on Friday where we had a lot of leaders um, from various cities, you know, New Haven, Bridgeport, Hartford, um, they were talking, uh, you know, there was some discussion about the cop on the beat, you know, they, I don't know if they ever used that term, but they, they were talking about getting people out and walking. Um, you know, I know that we at one point in Bloomfield had a bicycle patrol um, I, and I remember talking to when I was out riding my bicycle, I, I, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, I ran into one of the officers, had a nice chat with him about that. Uh, I know in Hartford, and I, I don't know if it's still the case, they at one point had a horse patrol uh, and all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, clearly the, um, the true, um, you know, the contiguous urban environment where you have a, you know, walkable walkable towns where people spend a lot of time walking and using other modes of transportation other than the automobile makes this much easier to have that kind of variety of things. But what are we what are what are we doing currently in Bloomfield and how effective do you think that kind of thing would be? Because I, you know I think that whole issue of people knowing their police officers and feeling comfortable with them being in the community, not necessarily living here, but being out in the community and being a part of it, uh, I think that's extremely important. Uh, how, how does that get actualized? So, so I encourage the officers on patrol to get out of their car, especially Capaco Plaza and 
Wittenberry Plaza across the street and in neighborhoods and interact with people uh, seasonably, se seasonally rather, sorry, I'm starting to jumble some words. Seasonally, seasonally, we put out the, the bike patrol, usually starts in May and goes until October. Um, this year, we hadn't put it out. We'll probably do it in the next week or so. We hadn't put it out because of our, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and limiting the number of officers that we had on um, and trying to keep them as far away from one another as possible. Um, I, we had initially, when Louis Chapman hired me back in 2011, we had talked about foot beats in town. The bicycle has been a, a better application of that because you can cover more ground and still have that interpersonal exchange um, that you want with members of the community. It's ironic that you, you mentioned the, the uh, mounted patrol. Um, what many of you might not know was that my wife was one of the original members of the mounted patrol in Hartford um, for a period of about 10 years. Um, they, they disbanded the mounted patrol uh, due to, uh, to budget cutbacks. And I'll pat myself on the back a little bit, but when I became deputy chief in Hartford, I reinstituted the mounted patrol. Um, and they worked in a facility uh, right next to the Ebony Horsewoman in Hartford on, on Vine Street. Um, and then just recently they, they disbanded them because of budget cutbacks. So uh, hopefully they have a local advocate who loves uh, the equine uh, disciplines as much as I did to reinstill that. It's very expensive, so I'm not going to be pitching that to the town council uh, in the next budget. Um, but uh, certainly, if anybody has any interest, I'd be happy to, to talk it through. There's some mothballed equipment in Hartford that uh, I'm sure we could break out and start riding down the street. <laughs> thank you very much, Chief. Um, thank you to everyone that attended tonight. Um, at, at one point in time, I think we were up to 27 attendees. So thank you very much. I know the meeting was a little lengthy, but I do believe that it was necessary. I can also promise there will be other community conversations um, on this and other topics. Um, the uh, Community Awareness Task Force will be reinstituted. The uh, Community uh, Policing um, Committee we will look at that. We will look at some things that we're learning from our neighbors who are doing some really, really good and creative things with policing. So there's gonna be a lot to discuss um, tonight. Chief, I wanna thank you very much, yes. sir. I appreciate you. I'm going to start our council comments. I'm gonna limit everyone to two minutes. I'm gonna start with um, Mr. Merritt, if he can unmute himself. I will do so. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I really uh, enjoyed the, tonight's discussion. It was very thorough, and I think people had some good ideas. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Politis, please unmute yourself. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to be brief as well. Um, as discouraged I was a couple of weeks about, ago about the incidents in town, I'm very encouraged about the conversation we had tonight how proactive our police department has been and continues to be. Um, nobody can be perfect, but I think we're working hard to try to be as close to it as possible. I think the, con the continuation of this discussion is going to help in that respect. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Councilor Politis. I do wanna say thank you again on behalf of the entire council and the town for taking care of young Miles and his bicycle. Young Miles got a bicycle from the Boonville Bike Shop and he got a helmet and Counselor Politis made sure that that happened. Um, he also got another bike um, from the gentleman from site. He, he got a few different bikes from a few different people who saw this story and who wanted to show Miles that not everyone that didn't look like him was mean and vile and disgusting and that was great. But Councilor Politis jumped on this immediately. And I will say thank you again, sir. Yes. If, if I may. He, yes. He actually, he actually donated a bike back right. to the, the yep. back, back to the bike shop. And the bike shop is gonna fix it up and donate it to the fire department at Christmas time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Councilor Goff, please unmute yourself. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, actually, I, I just want to make a couple of quick comments about other things happening. I think we've had a very thorough and uh, insightful uh, discussion tonight, tonight about uh, uh, the whole policing issue. But I wanted to remind people that the cooling center, obviously with the heat out there, uh, I think something came out on the cooling center, and I would like to make sure that the town manager uh, addresses that so that people know what is available, because I think it's going to be hot the next few days. Um, we also had a notice that uh, we need to be careful about water. People haven't noticed it hasn't rained a whole lot since April. So uh, people need to be aware that um, water restrictions, uh, well, certainly voluntary water restrictions um, are, are sort of in force and uh, may be coming. And finally, um, just be, this is the last um, council meeting of June. Uh, I want to, you know, we wish everyone a happy 4th of July. Uh, and I think that um, this 4th of July, especially, it's gonna be a real time for reflection with all the things we've seen in this country in the last, you know, this country and the world, actually, in the last um, six months, especially with the uh, pandemic, uh, now with all of the, um, issues related to the, uh, you know, the George Floyd killing. And I think that um, it's, it's going to be a real time for reflection. I always, uh, I always uh, pull out uh, uh, Dylan uh, doing uh, tears of rage from the basement tapes, um, even though, even though the carrying you in his arms, there's only about his daughter, everyone thinks it's about the flag. Uh, but that's a, a wonderful song to uh, think about and reflect as we move to the 4th of July. Thank you. Councilor DiLorenzo, can you please unmute? I can. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> well, Chief, uh, thank you for tonight. I think um, very, very informative. I really appreciate uh, all the discussion that we had tonight. A lot of good comments were raised. Many of them, uh, many things were already answered that I wanted to ask about. But, you know, I, I really, one of the things I've always, you know, did, feel maybe we we did have was too many police on our force uh was always a question i had wondered about and i think with some, some of the new directions and some of the uh change in community policing and the addition of other types of roles to the police force maybe we'll be able to determine that the need to have you know 48 full-time police in a town of, you know, 20,000, where we relatively have no crime whatsoever, which I'm very proud of this town. I love this town. It's safe and good and a nice place to live and work. And I want to keep it that way. And I think a lot of the discussions we were having tonight can keep take us in that direction. But I also want to remind everybody of, you know, how good of a police department we do have under your leadership, Chief. We were one of the first to get the cameras, the body cams, as you said. We have an accredited department and you're on your second accreditation or third. Um, also, we instituted the cadet program, which was purposely put in place to bring in recruits from the town of Bloomfield who lived here and wanted to work here and join the police department. We actually had two positions there, but unfortunately we weren't able to keep both filled and we had to cut it back to one, but um, that's still something that's available to our citizens here who are interested in that program. So, you know, although we've had some rough times uh, over the last month or so, I think overall we have to look at the bigger picture of things. And in general, we have a great department here uh, great leadership and great police. And I hope that we could continue to, you know, move in that positive direction and continue to have these conversations, which I, I found very, very good and rewarding. So I thank you for all for that. And Chief, I don't know if you want to respond to my comment, but uh, that was a question I've asked for a long time, if, if we really truly need the number of full-time police that we have, given that, um, you know, that equals like one officer for every, you know, basically 500 people in town. So uh, I'm hoping that through some of these other discussions, we can, um, you know, move in different directions. So thank you. Never off the hot seat, am I? <laughs> you know, you can answer it now. You, don't you have can to answer. answer it. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a long explanation, well, I won't say a long explanation. 
staffing levels are, are very comprehensive. Um, and I, I, was, I was happy to see in our last um, uh, staffing study by whatever the matrix group or whatever that they, they, they confirmed our, our level, um, which is not just based on the crime level, but it's based on um, response times for different calls for service. The number one call that we have in Bloomfield are medical calls and our, our police officers are first responders. So it's how long do you want to wait um, when you call for assistance in a medical emergency um, that dictates how many people you have, how many officers you have per shift and how many, uh, how many shifts per day, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in Hartford, you have, you have at the height, you have 35 to 40 officers working on a shift. In Bloomfield, we have six, you know, so it's definitely relative based on the community. Um, and based on on, the, on a lot of those response times. But I think that as we look to to study a lot of these these issues and how we can have other disciplines perhaps come to bear on some of the calls that, that we and, and, and requests that we get, then that may lead to to a, a reduction in, in, in the service size or in the in the department allocation size. And I'm, I'm certainly open to that, you know, if it if it improves the the quality of service that we're delivering, then I'm an advocate for it. Excellent. Councilor Calhoun. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I would also like to offer up good conversation um, for tonight. And I know that this won't be the last of this type. Um, what I would like in light of Chief, I have two new policies for you. As you know, um, I live in a high uh, traffic area and I get a lot of comings and goings with a lot of different uh, police that are on duty. So I, um, I usually am the one to initiate smiles and waves. Um, I'd like to have officer do that at times. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a feel good thing. I, I don't mind doing it, but it, it would be nice okay. to, you know, throw your hand up. Hey, how you doing um, today? Yes, so I couldn't agree yeah. more. Yeah. Um, so everyone have a great Fourth of July up and coming. Um, continue to be safe. Um, and uh, God bless. Councilor Curtin. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I want to start off by also echoing the same thing my colleagues have said about the chief. You know, thank you for your commitment and dedication to the town. And I know we're gonna work um, in the months to come to, you know, better see how we can communicate with residents and and uh, work to b continue building on what we've built over the years, your nine years here in the town. I, I want to also, we usually are here on the council and we don't do things. Uh, I don't think anyone here is here for praise and we're here because we're committed to the town. We love this town and we, we enjoy doing what we do. I truly do enjoy being on the council, but I really do want to take this opportunity to extend my, my gratitude to the mayor and her commitment. Um, the vigil a couple, uh, feels like a month ago uh, on the town green, bringing the town together. Uh, we received a lot of feedback about that because what I love about this town, we're not afraid to have tough conversations at least the tone that you're setting. We need to have these conversations because I believe that if you do have the conversations, you can avoid a lot of the mishaps that we're seeing that are going on around the country. So I wanna commend you for that. And it, it's, a, it's a perfect example of what the governor and Lieutenant Governor saw in your leadership because I felt last Friday was an example of all the places they could have went, they choose Bloomfield to have this discussion. And I think we should take pride in that, that uh, the governor and lieutenant governor acknowledge that Bloomfield are leaders in, in, in those areas and trying to make sure that we, we take the initiative to engage our community, engage our police force to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to avoid uh, the mishap. You know, things happen, you can't avoid certain things, but I think if you do have those conversations and you have those dialogues, I think you can avoid a lot of the things that we are seeing around the country. So I just want to commend you for your leadership on that. And uh, let's just continue 
move it along. I think we're on the right path. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to read two um, uh, comments. Uh, Rayla says, thank you all so much. I feel like our town is leading the way in Connecticut, and I'm glad that we are getting uh, these matters addressed. I also appreciate the current email updates coming from the town, keeping us informed. Meredith says, today I sit in my house with the door open at 949, <laughs> living in a high crime area of Bloomfield. I really feel safe because of the response time of the police and the ability to have community patrol whenever I request it. I hope that we have further discussions before the reduction of the force is brought to the table. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, Councilor Wong, please unmute. Oh, there we go. Thank you. I mean, I echo all of my peers today and the comments. I think we have such a talent um, with you. Um, Chief Hammock um, being a part of our town and I'm encouraged that you continue to provide exemplary exemplary and um, quality response to to the town um, and I don't have much to say um, I'll leave with a quote the future belongs to those who prepare for it today Malcolm X thank you Deputy Mayor thank you Madam Mayor uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, citizens who showed up uh, a part of the Zoom uh, to talk about and be, register their concerns about policing in town. I think it's extremely important that there's a dialogue between the town and the, and the, and the citizens and their police force. And I think they have uh, hopefully uh, gotten the feeling that that conversation is, is easily had in this town. And I'm extremely proud, in fact, that uh, there was a speedy reaction to the two incidents that we had here in town. Speedy, by most people's concern, by most people's estimate, some people say nothing is fast enough, but the, there's investigation that was involved, and I think the outcomes are appropriate. And I hope people can rest easy, because I think people have been very much overwhelmed by all the things that are happening in our society these days, especially when they see you know, police brutality in other places. They're very much concerned for their their own security and wonder about, well, what happens if I went down in the street? What would... So it's very help, helpful to have this uh, presentation, these questions. Now, they're only questions and only presentation. The, the, the proof is in the pudding, of course, and we've got to continue to do the kind of work that we have said we are doing and, and represent ourselves to the, to the rest of the community. And in that, in that respect, I look forward to continue working as member of the uh, Public Safety Committee to see how we can continue to make improvements. So thank you very much. It was a great discussion. Um, before I do my comment, I'm gonna ask the town manager to speak to what Councillor Goff was talking about, the um, cooling center. Yes, ma'am. I got a, a call from Yvette today. Um, uh, emergency management and uh, the senior services folks have gotten together. Um, we're adding a, a little bit of complexity to when we determine when we're going to uh, provide cooling services and humidity is a part of it. Um, we find that humidity uh, plays a real part in detrimental effects on seniors uh, in the summertime. And so you're going to see us open the cooling centers a little earlier uh, if you were just looking at the temperature. So we're going to be looking at a combination of humidity and temperature uh, this year and, and moving forward and opening those, opening those centers. Um, it's still a struggle for us at times to get people to uh, come in. Some people don't want, uh, they, they don't want to show up at the cooling center. And so we try to offer uh, alternative activities for them so that they uh, would feel okay about being there. Some, some people um, don't want to go there and have other people see them there, but we actually want people to come and be healthy and be comfortable and not have their medication at, react adversely because they're in a hot human situation that, that overheats them. So we want to encourage people to visit uh, and we will be open a little more frequently as we go through this humid weather. Excellent, thank you. I wanna thank, um, thank you, thank Carrie, thank Sharon for uh, being with us on today. I also wanna highlight the fact that this was uh, Bloomfield High School Centennial graduation. 
they this is their hundredth graduation for Bloomfield High School, and it was an amazing graduation. It wasn't what they were used to, but they decorated that place outside. The stage was there. They had the flag flying. It was an absolute wonderful time. I also would like to congratulate Miss Lauren Serafino, um, a special education teacher at Carmen Airy. Teacher. I think she has a bad connection. You're breaking up, Suzette. Uh -oh. That's weird. We'll give her a moment and then. I think she dropped, but. Um... Uh oh. Give her can another minute. Back on? And then, David, you can. Sure. Okay, let her log back on. Yeah, she's coming. So, David, you want to make any remarks? <laughs> no, I, I've already made my remarks and there's nothing left to do but adjourn this meeting, but I wanted to give the give the mayor a chance to come back if she, it depends on the rest of you, how much time she, you want. She's time. calling me. Yep. We did get a chance to highlight the graduates. On the sign, on the electronic sign board in front of actually my house and in the center of town. She's she's receiving a Zoom error, so we thank you everyone for the meeting. We'll do this again, and we will call for an adjournment. Motion on the floor. <laughs> So moved. Councilor second. Wong, Councilor Goff has second. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.